married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. It was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. 10 o'clock, Saturday night, that was the woke that was. We've got Pete Barnes, we've got Lois Perry, and we've got the author of Gender Madness, Ollie London, and we've got someone I don't like. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to the show. I'm Julia Harley Brewer and you're with Talk TV. We are on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Coming up in this hour, well, nearly half of Tory MPs have refused to back the Prime Minister's smoking ban. The legislation passed a key vote with the backing of Labour MPs. But 59 Tories voted against the measure and 106 abstained. Meanwhile, the strictest head teacher in Britain, Catherine Burble Singh, has won her legal battle waged against her by a Muslim pupil after the High Court ruled that her school's prayer ban was both legitimate and proportionate to maintain the secular character and ethos of the Michaela Community School. As Burble Singh herself said, if you don't like it, don't send your kids to this school. And Nigel Farage has hit out at what he called an updated form of Soviet Communism after the socialist mayor of Brussels tried to shut down the National Conservatism Conference where he was speaking yesterday. I'll be talking to another of the speakers later in the show. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Emily Rose Adams. This is Talk TV News. Good morning. The foreign secretary is in Israel to discuss its response to Iran's weekend drone and missile strikes. Lord Cameron's joined calls by the US and the EU to place restrictions on Iran, but is urging Israel not to retaliate with force. Well, the former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth told Talk Today if Iran's strikes weren't intercepted, they could have had grave consequences. 30 cruise missiles. Imagine that happening to the United Kingdom. I mean, this could have caused untold damage uh, in uh, Israel had it, and loss of life had it not been for the effectiveness of the ground-based air defense, which uh, Israel has, and the spontaneous support of its allies, the United States, United Kingdom, France and Jordan. The Prime Minister's major plan to phase out smoking is one step closer to coming into law. Despite some opposition, the proposals to ban smoking among youngsters passed its first hurdle in the Commons last night. Well, Rishi Sunak wants to raise the legal age each year in a bid to phase out the habit as well as restrict the sales of vapes. Well, on the streets, there's been mixed reaction. Yeah, it's good because kids can't smoke then, can they? But people do get people to go to the shop, don't they, to buy them. So it's not really going to stop anyone, is it? And I personally think cigarettes can't be banned. People will go mad. I think it does set a good example. I think it's good. It prevents a lot of younger people from smoking in the future has fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years as cost of living pressures continue to ease. Inflation fell from 3.4 to 3.2 percent in March, meaning what we pay for goods and services is going up more slowly. Well, the Office for National Statistics says food prices was one of the major contributing factors. And the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, says the plan is working. Inflation is falling faster than expected. There are growing calls to outlaw smacking in England and in Northern Ireland. Children's doctors say the laws as they stand are dangerously vague and have published a report warning hitting children at home can cause lasting mental and physical effects. And smacking kids is already illegal in Scotland and in Wales. The Sydney shopping centre that was the scene of a deadly stabbing attack will open tomorrow for a community reflection day, allowing people to come and pay their respects. Six people were killed on Saturday, including a new mum. The mall's owners say they're tightening security going forward. And Taylor Swift fans have been conned out of more than a million pounds by scammers selling fake tickets for her current tour. Lloyds Bank has been analysing reports from more than 600 customers who thought they were buying tickets for her era's tour. On average, they lost more than £300 each, but some of them lost more than 1000 
Well, consumer rights expert Martin James has told us this is an easy scam aimed at fans who would have missed out on buying tickets. It's a huge, huge scam at the moment. Loads and loads are being affected. Frauds like this play on people's demand and their desire um, to show their fandom and their support for the artists that they love. You're up to date with the headlines. Now for a look at today's weather with Nancy Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, blustery out there once again for today, particularly the further east you are near the area of low pressure that's working its way southwards, bringing plenty of showers across the eastern side of the UK today. And some inland showers are likely, but the heaviest and most thundery ones will be across parts of the east where it will be feeling cool. Temperatures are only up into the high single figures. Out towards the west, some good amounts of sunshine up into double figures, 12 degrees Celsius at best. But across parts of Northern Ireland, the east of the Republic and later western parts of Wales and southwest England, there will be showery rain rain through this afternoon. But going into tonight, a lot of the showers will clear away southwards and that rain out in the west, so it will be largely dry and clear. The winds will become lighter as well, so it will be colder compared to the last few nights. And in some rural spots, especially around England and Wales, a frost is likely. There will also be cloud, wind and rain starting to approach the northwest of the UK. That's the no next low pressure system that will bring showery spells of rain across much of Scotland and Northern Ireland through tomorrow, then later Northern England, the north of Wales and parts of the Midlands. The far south, though, should stay mostly fine and bright. And yet again, it will be another cool day. Temperatures up to 10 degrees Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew. Thank you very much indeed for joining. Welcome back to our show here on Talk TV with you on radio, online, on TV and on your smart speaker. And uh, joined today, uh, as we are on every uh, Wednesday, by uh, Benedict uh, uh, Spence, who is a conservative commentator. And I'm oh, just find out like why you weren't at the conservatism conference in Brussels that they tried to shut down. We'll, we'll find out a bit <laughs> later in the show, I'm sure. Fascinating story that. But there is so much to talk about. Uh, David Cameron, Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary over in Israel, a, a statement this morning. We will come to that. But front pages of an awful lot of the newspapers today is about a um, big friend of the show, Catherine Burble Singh, known mm. as Britain's strictest head teacher. She is a head teacher of a, also one of the best schools in the country. What a surprise. Uh, the Michaela Community School, where, of course, she basically applies her values, which she says British values, to the school in terms of the ethos and despite having peoples from every possible background, 50% uh, by the way being Muslim, um, she has an ethos in the school where you know, we are all British, we're all school pupils here, you, your identity, whatever your religion or your race is not interesting, it's not relevant, mm -hmm. we are about what unites us, not what divides us, which is one of the reasons why she fought against a pupil who wanted to have a Muslim prayer, prayer ritual uh, during uh, certain religious times. Um, this was banned by the school on the basis that it was dividing pupils, causing intimidation of a number of other pupils, particularly other Muslim pupils during Ramadan. One pupil gave up going to choir, having been told, oh, well, this isn't you know, a thing you should be doing during Ramadan and things like that. Um, it's gone to court. Extraordinarily, the mother of the pupil managed to get legal aid, tens of thousands of pounds worth of legal aid, uh, to take this matter to the High Court. Thankfully, yesterday, the High Court saw sense. It is a victory for common sense. Um, and uh, basically ruled in favour of the school and their right to ban Muslim prayer rituals in the playground, except to their fact that they don't have a spare room they can turn into a prayer room, and that actually the ethos of the school is very simple. And as Catherine Burble Singh said, pretty much in a, in a statement, you know, if you don't like the values of the school, if you don't like the rules of the school, you can send your child to a different school. Mm. She's right, isn't she, Benedict? She is. I mean, we're not short in, in this country on schools that have a lot of provisions for <laughs> parents and pupils who uh, have religious beliefs and want to adhere to that uh, up and to and in over the point at which it might impact on their studies. I think that's the big thing about this, is that the proof is in the pudding with this school. The results are exemplary. People come from all sorts of uh, all sorts of backgrounds. Par Many par of them are. Parents don't speak English. Yeah. They're living on housing estates. They're, you know, estates, they are, they are free school income. meals. Yep. They, you know, these are, these are children who 
The rest of the education establishment has said, well, of course we expect these children to fail. Mm. What can you do? Mm. Poverty of low expectations. Yeah. Uh, Catherine Burble Singh said, uh, no, these kids can all be achieving top grades. And what a surprise they do. They do. And I think that one doesn't want to sort of second guess the motives as to why this case was brought. Don't but, we? Well, this, <laughs> I'm going to now. It, it's <laughs> it absolutely. It's, it, it's one of those things where you do just have to think, is it a, an attempt to sort of, you know, a, a impose a, a way of thinking or a system on other people? Is it a way simply to be a bit different? We know a lot of children often just try to be rebellious for the sake of being rebellious. Yeah, they don't normally get their parents to get legal aid to, to do that. I mean, they you know, don't, I wanted but... to wear my tie a bit mm. differently from the school rules at my comp. But you know what? You just got put in detention. But, End of story. But in some ways, quite ambitious children might be applauded for taking it that far, for having the, the, the imagination to think, how can I really twist the knife? How can I really get attention? I could go this far. Do you know Either what my way, response is? I know what your response is going go to be. Go to your room. Yeah. <laughs> go to your room. <laughs> go to your room, come out when you could be nice. <laughs> that wasn't the response of the parent, though. The parents seem to agree with the child. But the most extraordinary <laughs> thing about this, not only did the parent mm. back this, and again, and, and, and this case sort of went all the way to court after Catherine Burble sings it, right, you know, there'll be no prayer rituals in mm. the playground. Again, up to 30 children praying very openly in the playground. Um, you know, they hadn't done it before. They were absolutely fine without it before. Their parents yeah. signed up to a school. They, she told them what the rules were, what the ethos was. And, and, uh, and, and then when she banned that, we then saw, you know, bricks through uh, teachers' windows, a black teacher who was racially abused. We mm. saw intimidation of other pupils. Clearly unacceptable. Clearly, uh, you know, again, this is, this is not about your, your, right, you know, your, your right to be religious. Well, no, you've, you've chosen not to send your child to a faith school. Mm. You've, I mean, you've literally, you had that choice. I mean, I'm an atheist, right? I had no state schools near me that were not religious. Yeah. Not one. All but one of the state schools near me, when I was looking at primary schools for my daughter, required you to have gone to church, basically, since before you'd even thought about having a baby, long mm. before they were actually born. You get a downside more choice if, you're, if you have faith in this country. So, you know, you've chosen a non-faith school, and then, you know, then stick with it. But the most extraordinary thing is the, the mother and the, the, the child have said, there are other things they might want to take legal action over. I mean, yeah, no you know, if you're that unhappy, move schools. Mm. Um, but also, the, the, the mother has applied for her the, 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 the pupil's younger sibling mm. to go to the school in the autumn. Yeah, because I mean, they recognise extraordinary. Because they recognise that it's a very good school and that its techniques actually work. But I think, you know, again, one of the things I think we have to praise about uh, Catherine Burble Singh's approach Among is, the million things. Yeah, yeah. Is that she's steadfast on this, that she recognises that bringing in special dispensations for different groups causes division. That's you know, literally the opposite of harmony. That literally yeah. stops what the whole point of the school is about. You can't sort of give in to this. And, you know, if it's this particular group, and that's because yeah. of you know, the thing, not just talking about Muslims in general here, praying. No, it's not. One particular strain of Islam, and then the next one, then the next, and then the Catholics, and then the Protestants. Mm. You know, where does it end? You have to find special spaces for all of them? Yeah. Do they have to share? And it's a very Will they be fighting school. over time? Yeah, they yeah, have it's... no spare rooms at all. Yeah. They have tiny little rooms. It's an indulgence, is what this is. It is. And as she's saying again, it's, you know, she, so much about diversity politics, she said in a very lengthy statement, uh, as, is about dividing people and finding all the reasons why we're different, as opposed to, this is what we're united by. These are our values. This is what we believe in. This is what we do. It's one of the reasons why we have kids wearing school uniforms. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. You've heard what Benedict and I think. Uh, Britain's strictest hit teacher, Catherine Bubble Singh, has won her high court battle against a Muslim people who challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals. Just let me want to know, what is your reaction? You know, do you support her? Do you support the pupil? Do you think there's, you know, you sitting on the fence on this one? I'd love to hear your thoughts. You can give us a call. 0344 499 uh, You can also send a WhatsApp on the same number. You can text us on 8722 uh, or you can uh, send us a message on x at Talk TV. I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of that. Let's also talk about the, um, the vote in the House of Commons last night. There's one in the House of Laws on Rwanda, vote in the House of Commons on the, uh, the, the smoking ban announced mm. by Rishi Sunak, a big announcement in October Tory party conference. And I think most of us were pretty surprised. This, this is the thing you're going to do to change the country. Mm. And that was bringing in a smoking ban. Anyone born from the 1st of January 2009 onwards, so 15 roughly now, um, you're never going to be illegally allowed to buy cigarettes. Now, mm. we talked about this on the show a lot yesterday. Um, I've written a piece for The Sun today. And again, I'm, you won't find a more avid anti-smoker than me yeah can't can't bear smoking i think it's insane i genuinely think it's insane to smoke it's such a no-brainer in terms of your health um and, and we've got vaping as an alternative they go vape it's not it's not perfectly safe but it's a lot safer um i'd love it if no one smoked in this country if my daughter smoked i've got to be honest with you the reaction would be probably illegal from me
not telling not telling a lie there but um talk of a smoke of, of a smacking ban today as well um but um at the end of the day i don't think this is how you change people's smoking habits and i don't think you can bring in a law I, where mm. one adult can go in and buy cigarettes and another adult a day younger than them can't. It's absurd. I mean, that is a particular nonsense, that idea that you're going to have this sort of divide and it moves up slowly every year, as if people won't find a very easy way around that. And as if the police are actually going to enforce that in a time when they don't really, you know, enforce all sorts of rules. When it comes to actually illegal drugs and things like that, you, we often find that they just don't respond. What, they're going to go to every sort of corner shop and check, you know, every time a, you know, a shop owner says, oh, this person is underage. Yeah. Or, yeah, that's, it's a nonsense, yeah. it's posturing, it's making it look as if they're doing something something when in fact they aren't but also it is i'm afraid very I illiberal very draconian yeah. it's un as well as being unnecessary it's the first step if you like because i think a lot of people will you know a lot of people will just go cigarettes are bad like you yeah. and therefore a lot of people will actually unlike you say i haven't got a problem with a cigarette ban I'm, but where I'm, then does I it end? the indoor ban because that has an impact on other people mm. whether you were working in a bar as i'd done or whether you were sitting in an office i mm. sit surrounded genuinely in all sides by mm. chain smokers at six o'clock in the morning but what next is the thing because exactly. once this has happened and once they feel that they can bring this in i'm telling you it's going to happen for alcohol at some point in this country. Which Sugar. A lot of people say, oh, it'll never happen. It's too deeply ingrained in our culture. Smoking was very deeply ingrained in our culture. Mm. Lots of people yeah. smoked. They thought it was healthy. They and the same it was people, the same sort of do-gooders and, and, yeah. and you know, public health finger waggers, they, um, they're the people who say that even one glass of wine a day is mm. bad for you. No, it's not. There's no evidence for this statement whatsoever. Mm. Um, it, it, I mean, it is just ridiculous. My thing is, you know, it's, I, I was very nanny state in, in, in my younger years that sort of, well, you know, I don't like it and I don't do it, so let's ban it. And then you realise, oh, well, no, what if they come for something of mine? So maybe if it's not imposed on me, imposed mm. on me, so I'm not sitting next to someone in a restaurant who's, you know, you know people used to hold their cigarettes like, like this, sort of behind, <laughs> they used to hold them like behind them. Oh, I'm glad mm. you're not getting the smoke, but I do. Mm. And I, genuinely, it was unpleasant, it was smelly, it was bad for other people's health. But, but if someone wants to smoke in their own home or smoke outside, it's none of my damn business what they want to do with their health. Mm. And, and if we are saying it's, oh, it's the impact on the NHS, um, you know what, it's a very slippery slope because you're going to start stop banning people from being obese. It's not a good idea to be obese, mm. but I think people have the right to be obese if they want to. I mean, nowadays, being obese is worse for you on average or worse for the NHS than smoking is. Mm. You know, it causes a lot more illness, a lot more cancers, yep. a lot more suffering. So you're right. At what point? And then what's the next thing? You know, poor sleep quality kills an awful lot of people. They're going to give us mandated bedtimes? You know, it's the sort I, of thing where you wouldn't I, be surprised. I <laughs> don't think they would, have, they would stop that. The funny thing about these people who were really, really big on all these rules and finger wagging mm. adults, they're remarkably bad at parenting, these people. Yes. They're all sort of those liberal parents who don't think children should have rules. Yeah. I've, I've nef definitely noticed the people who are most in favour of, of curbs on what adults can do bloody useless parents whose mm. children are absolutely foul and, and are the sort of people that you sort of snarl at in restaurants. Well, if you're me. <laughs> if you're me, you just trip them up you when they run past say, your you table. snarl, snarl that's a lot just of children? Me. People think I'm joking when I say that. No, I literally do that. Uh, anyway, what do you think, though, in terms of the politics of this? Because it was a free vote, so mm. technically speaking, you know, you, you're allowed to vote against the government. We saw Kemi Bejanok, the only cabinet minister, but none of other ministers voted against this. Mm. Um, uh, we had 59 Tory MPs in total vote against the message, 106 abstained, I have to say, which is pretty poor. So, you know, if you agree with it, vote for it. If yeah. you don't agree with it, vote against it. The abstaining is very plur. Yes. But it went through with Labour votes. Um, <laughs> but pretty much half the Conservative Party didn't back the Prime Minister. Is this, I mean, again, a lot of those are leadership hopefuls. Mm. Is this quite a statement about where, how he stands it, it, with, among his party? I think so, and I think it's also sort the of drawing, drawing sort away. of battle lines, actually, for the post British Sunak era. You've got people like yeah. Kemi Bainock actually sort of standing there going, no, actually, this is not something that I agree with. And Conservative members will notice that, because let's be clear, we don't expect Rishi Sunak to be leader of the Conservative Party when he loses the election. So there's going to be a lot of people jumping on that opportunity, yeah. and I think a lot of people will accept that this is posturing, but it's also the sort of posturing that a lot of them want to see, having been yeah. let down for so long by Indeed. a series of Conservative prime ministers. More posturing also by the uh, peers in the House of Lords, although that, you know, with mm. the Randall bill, that is expected to become law by Friday. But mm. um, uh, you mentioned sort of leadership hopefuls. Well, an awful lot of them, by the way, were over in Brussels yesterday for a conference, uh, the National Conservatism Conference. Um, it was uh, held in the Belgian capital. It was already on its third venue. Mm. Uh, the uh, socialist mayor of Brussels having basically put pressure on venues to uh, to to close down uh, and and cancel the conference. They managed to get it ahead, um, and it was I mean just extraordinary. Nigel Farage was on stage 
um, the president of the Reform UK party, when police came to try and shut it down, three police officers came, uh, they decided quite wisely they weren't going to try and cart him off the stage, he carried on, it ended up with a standoff with dozens and dozens and dozens of armed sort of shielded police officers outside refusing to allow anyone in including some guest speakers mm. and refusing to allow anyone out so people were stuck there but also and um, refusing to allow the catering company in to this hotel so uh, or this venue so um, people have you know if you want to stay you've got no food for the day if you leave you can't come back but um we're told you though know, unsavory characters there was a risk of there being some sort of physical violence mm. uh, i mean Surely, if there's physical violence, I mean, why don't you tackle the people committing the physical violence rather than a completely legitimate conference? But we've even heard you, know, Politico referred to this as a hard right conference. Mm. Um, Kay Burley this morning on Sky News, which I made the mistake of watching, talked about the unsavoury characters mm. sharing the platform. Um, we talk about, so Nigel Farage, who won like, you know, basically one of the key you know, figures of, of British politics. Suella Bradman, former Home Secretary. Mm. Um, Miriam Case, leading uh, Tory MP, um, and right on an awful lot of things, I have to say. Um, uh, we, we had, um, uh, I mean, um, well, I mean who, else, who else was there? Um, uh, Liz Truss was, is due mm. to be there, um, the former Mac, Prime Minister. Yeah. Viktor Orban, the Hungarian pr Prime Minister. Now, may not like him, may not agree with his politics. Mm democratically elected figure an awful lot of the leaders of parties who Nigel Farage pointed out are likely to win the European elections in June mm. across many countries and his socialist mayor sh tried to shut this conference down it wasn't just politicians there were academics there as well people like Matt Goodwin lots yeah. of people actually who are fairly I'd say well-known household names certainly within conservative mm. politics not actual fringe lunatics I mean, the first thing that I was very curious about was why it was being held in Brussels, because Brussels is not famously a particularly tolerant place, um, especially for politicians who don't like the idea of Brussels. Um, it's it's you know, really an easy place for a lot of people to get to. You'd think so, but I don't think London is exactly hard to travel to. It is an international hub, but that's beside the point. It is a deeply illiberal thing to see. Um, but again, it, it's one of those things that you shouldn't really be surprised about because, as you say, there are people referring to it as hard right and sort of dismissing it out of hand. Well, once people feel that they can do that, and you see it a lot actually with you know, relatively normal conservative groups, you know, we, we had this with the five families, but you know, mm. supposedly getting progressively more and more right wing, but actually they're fairly standard, a lot of them. It's just easy, therefore, to dismiss, and people shrug and they go, oh, well, I don't like the far right, I yeah. don't like the hard right, this must be a good thing. And it's only sort of after the fact, after the police have turned up, after it's been broken up, that people go, Oh, hang on a second. I quite like that person. Why was, yeah. why, why was he cast off? But stage? either way, I don't care whether. I mean, genuinely, I, d I don't even want, you know, a, a, a BMP camp, uh, conference broken up. And I am absolutely abhor everything that they think. I think they are an openly, blatantly horrible mm. racist party. But you always fight bad ideas with good ideas, with debate, with facts, with your morality. You don't need to shut down people mm. who are spouting nonsense and hate. Mm. You defeat them with your words, with your ideas and your campaigns. But of course we have to remember the mayor of Brussels is a socialist. And that who, in, by that the way, has is happily a... invited properly, properly far-right figures mm. to, 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 to uh, meetings. Again, again, bearing in mind that people think I'm far-right. I mean, for God's, I mean, for God's sake. That's because you goose step into work. Okay, yeah, obviously, yeah. Okay. But, it, but, it's, but it's not. It's laughable though. These these terms, hard right, mm. far right, and what they mean, you know. But they never use some like far left about a lot of uh, people who are blatantly far left. And by the way, Labour Party, some mm. of the Labour Party being, you know, oh well, oh, these people, you know, show, you know, platforms with some very dodgy uh, yeah. people with strong extreme opinions. You try to get Jeremy Corbyn mm. elected as Prime Minister of this country, you know. Shut it. You do not have a leg to stand on. Again, it's that sort of sympathy that comes from, I think a lot of people, certainly in the media in this country, are centre-left. You'd say sort of soft-left, yeah. I think, of them. And they wouldn't necessarily ver verbalise that, but they are. And it's that sort of, OK, well, we don't like people like Jeremy Corbyn necessarily, but he's better than a centre-conservative. Yeah. So we'll tolerate it. And yeah. it's the same. These people are hard right. Actual socialists, well, they're just on the left. Yeah, they're not indeed. hard anything. Indeed. Um, look, um, David Cameron, the, uh, the Foreign Secretary, is over in Israel. Uh, he has uh, made... A statement this morning saying you know he wants you know he, he wants there to be uh, a sort of uh, he's saying it's right to have shown solidarity with Israel he says we hope that uh, when they make their decision to act regarding the Iran attack at the weekend we hope they do so in a way that does as little as to escalate this as possible mm. and in a way that he said as I said yesterday is smart as well as tough uh, the real need is to refocus back on Hamas he says and they also uh, talked about coordinated sanctions against Iran uh, certainly we need to re reinstigate those mm. um, do you think that Israel will be listening 
I, I suspect they probably will, because actually it's not in Israel's interest to prompt an existential war with Iran, in the same way that it's not in There'll Iran's There'll be a interest. response, but it'll be small scale. I suspect so, because Netanyahu, again, he can't be seen, much like the Iranians, they can't be seen to not be doing anything. But yes, I suspect there will be an attack on a military target, probably yeah. one that's not particularly valuable. Which would be completely legitimate. Completely legitimate, given actually what went before. But I think what is significant is it's an altering in the situation in that now both sides are prepared to directly target each yeah. other. There's no more of this, oh, well, we're going to hit a consulate and we're going to hit some civilians and we're going to do this, that and yeah. the other and we're going to get our proxies to steal a ship, any of that. It's now, OK, you fired a missile right at us. We can fire one back at you. Might not be a lot, might be very deliberately aimed at you know, a, a pointless ammo dump yeah. or something like that. But... That dynamic has changed, and that is very yeah, concerning. Absolutely. Um, let's get to the most important story of the day: mm. uh, the revelation that uh, Meghan, uh, the Duchess of Sussex, mm -hmm. is uh, going to launch a new jam. I know it's what we've all been waiting for. Everybody, she's got this new lifestyle brand. It's such. I genuinely think. Uh, uh, genuinely, I think mm. they they just they they went through a dictionary and went. Um, this <laughs> this page got the word American. This page, Riviera, this orchard. Yeah, American Riviera Orchard. That's a good name for a lifestyle brand. I mean, it, no, it's not. It's terrible. But their first the first launch is going to be a batch of strawberry jam and uh, the review's already gushing. Oh, wonderful. I mean... Have uh, been said, Hi, Megan, where's my jam? Love strawberry jam. Why, why, bearing in mind, though, mm. wouldn't it be allowed to be advertised on uh, the tube under Sadiq Khan? No, it's, it's drunk food. Because it's, it's basically... Processed. Sugar. Mm, I mean, it's basically you. sugar. That's what jam is. It's not. It's not strawberries. It's sugar. Yeah, the Sussexes are trying to kill people. Oh, there's a headline for you. No, I mean, I've, I've needed a, an alternative to Tip Tree and Bon Maman for a while. I, I definitely will try this out. I wonder what they're going to call it. Sticky situation? I have no idea. It's, yeah. <laughs> but strawberry, I think they could have come up with something a little bit more exciting I mean, than you that. you think, like, I don't know, fig and something. They're Hollywood celebrities. Avocado and light yeah. cheese. Something exciting. Strawberry jam. Is that the best you've got, <laughs> Megan? Anyway, we, we shall see. Anyway, obviously, it's the biggest story of the day. So I'm all, I want you to get in touch about that. No, I do not want to get in touch about that. <laughs> For the love of God, do not get in touch about Megan and Jab because I will ban you from listening forever and ever and ever. Uh, let's get back to our, our social media question, though. I'd love to hear from you. Please get in touch on the phones. Um, I want to know your reaction uh, to the uh, well, strictest head teacher in Britain, Catherine Burble Singh, uh, winning her high court battle yesterday against a Muslim pupil who challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals. Imagine taking your school to court because of something like this. It's extraordinary. I'm so pleased she stood up on this. I'm so pleased the court saw sense. I just want to know your reaction. Please give us a call. 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222 and get in touch at Talk TV as well. Let's go to some of those uh, messages we've already got in. Um, uh, Simon says, fantastic. What an amazing lady. Glad to see that the judge was sensible. Anthony says, if you want to pray, go to a religious school. I mean, yeah. Although I went to a bog standard comp, and I believe it is the law in this country, Benedict, that um, every state school has to have some element of religious ritual, of C of E ritual, because all schools ostensibly are Church of England schools, even if they don't say they're C of E schools. I believe it is actually the law. And yeah. I used to beg my, as an atheist child, to my atheist mother to not like, to get me excused from assembly. My mother said, tells you everything about my father's parity as an atheist, it's good for your soul. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Um, Martin says, about time too. These Muslim demands are getting out of control. School is for learning and not praying. Glad to see the judge saw common sense. Joanna says, she's quite a lady. I wish she was running all the schools. Oh, here, here. Uh, the pupils are well-behaved and obedient. They do well in learning and exams. She's a teacher that children will remember. And Darren says, you know the rules when you enrol your child in the school. There's nothing but trying to put imported religion as a priority in a place where it doesn't... Sorry, this is nothing but trying to put imported religion in a pri as a priority in a place where it doesn't belong. Mm. Yeah, lots of agreement. I'd love to hear from you if you disagree with this ruling and you think actually you, people should be allowed to do uh, have a prayer ritual at school, whatever their religion is. Do get in touch. I would love to hear it back from you. Uh, anyway, uh, coming up in just a few moments, we're going to talk about that smoking vote, Rwanda, and what is going on in the Middle East, and plenty more with uh, Tory MP Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Uh, this is Talk TV. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treacle. 
JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put the Statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> 40 <laughs> minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. Yeah, it was, it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning, welcome back to the show. This is Talk with me, Julia Hartley. But Benedict Spence also still in the studio. Uh, let's go to our, our first guest um, uh, on the line. Uh, it's Conservative MP Sir Geoffrey Clifton Brown. Good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Good morning. Great to be with you. Lovely to have you join us. Lots to get through. Uh, so let's go straight to it. Um, um, nearly half of Tory MPs last night, including quite a few Tory leadership hopefuls, uh, decided to, uh, well, fail to support, either vote against or abstain in the vote on the smoking ban. The big set-piece announcement from the Prime Minister at Tory conference last October. Um, how did you vote? So I thought long and hard about this. Uh, I was torn as a Conservative who believes in freedom of choice as opposed to the health benefits of trying to prevent some of our real youngsters uh, getting on the vaping and smoking um, bandwagon, if you like. And I think a lot of people in life would say that they wish they'd never started and they yeah. then find it very difficult to stop. So I was, I voted for it. Uh, so to, so to you do, in. so like, like actually MPP spoke to yesterday, you do believe in freedom and personal choice, but not really. I do absolutely believe in freedom and personal choice. Well, when you I don't, was a young because, man, because in a few years' time, the the the, the fifteen-year-olds who are currently you know, referenced in this bill will be eighteen, and they will be standing next to someone born a day before them who can legally buy uh, products sold legally in this country. As much as you and I despise the cancer sticks, that that is nevertheless a legal product, and the person next to them can. Different laws for two different adults in a nanny state conservative vote. I don't. Well, I don't well, think you do believe in freedom, Sir Jeffrey. I do. Um, uh, you could have gone much further uh, and banned smoking and vapes for everybody, but that really would have been um, too autocratic. Let me just take you back, if I may. When I was a young man studying politics, the uh, then government discussed bringing in compulsory wearing of seatbelts, and I don't think there's anybody now 
that would have wished that the government hadn't done that. And I think uh, in the future, people will be very pleased that actually we protected some of our youngsters from this real health. But this uh, isn't search. protecting youngsters. This is about adults. Uh, it's not about... Pro it's already illegal for under-18s to buy cigarettes. It's not about youngsters. You're not, when you're an 18-year-old, you're an adult. When you're a 37-year-old, you're an adult. You'll still legally not be allowed to buy, to buy cigarettes. And I do think that's rather different from seatbelts. Yeah, we know seatbelts save lives, but we also know it's a very small imposition. Look, I don't want anyone smoking. But if I were a Tory MP, if I were any kind of MP, I would have voted against this measure as an, as an unconservative measure, as an illiberal measure, like many of your, many of your colleagues. Well, it is about youngsters not being able to buy vapes. So I think it, that is the well, start. You can still, no, no, it's already illegal for youngsters to buy vapes under 18. It's about disposable vapes. You can still buy Correct. vapes. Young, Correct. I hate to tell Correct. you, Sir Geoffrey, young people are still going to be able to get their hands on fags well, and vapes. Well, I'm sure they are, but let's just make it a little bit more difficult. Uh, I, I, uh, it, this is a bill about adults, see? not youngsters. <laughs> Well, oh, eh, eh, whoever. Um, no, no, but... it's not whoever. We have lots of rules that, that stop under-18s from doing things. But the idea is that when you're over 18, that everyone has the same rights. You're going to have the right to buy a cigarette. I'm going to have the right to buy the cigarette. But, but you know, in, in a few years' time, an adult won't have the right to buy a cigarette because they were born since we were born. That, well, how on earth can you vote for that and claim your, well, you support <coughs> freedom? Julia, if I could just speak a word in edgeways... Uh, in the future, as the cohorts, age cohorts, progress through the system, older and older people will not be able to buy cigarettes and they will not be able to buy vapes. And frankly, um, if I've, by voting last night, saved a single person from getting a serious illness, then I think I've done the right okay. thing. Can I just say, this law does not ban vaping. No, of course it doesn't ban vaping. But, but they it, will it, be able to buy vapes then. They will be able to buy vapes, but not the disposable vapes. Right. I just want to and clarify progressive... that you knew what you were voting for. That, I no, mean, there's I, a genuine knew, concern I, I, about MPs these days. I knew exactly days. what I was voting for. All right. But, but as I say, uh, as we get through the system, it mm. will become harder and harder yeah. for youngsters to buy vapes and, and buy cigarettes, and it will extend to older and older cohorts. Okay. What's, what's next on the banned list? Alcohol? Meat? No, come on, come on. Sugar? Come on, come on, come what do you mean, come, come, on, on? come on? Most of the most of the meddling public health bodies who want to uh, uh, ban cigarettes, uh, which can, I'm, you know, I'd love it if no one smoked. Seriously, they also they've also come after alcohol. They're coming after sugar. They think we're they think we're too stupid to see an advert for a McDonald's and not immediately go, I need a burger. I mean, you know, they don't they don't think much of us, the general public, do they? Well, they do. I think when people are seriously ill and they've reflected whether they would have liked to start vaping and liked to have start smoking and wished they'd be able to give it up, actually, if the government had prevented them doing it, then that will be a very useful thing. I mean, the, the number of deaths each year is caused by smoking is 80,000 deaths. So this is a serious problem for the health service. And I think every, every little bit we can do to try and help people live, make sensible decisions okay, in this then, respect. Then why, then why doesn't the law go further? Why don't you just ban smoking today for everybody? Well, I've just said to you, I think we could have That's done that. That's going too far. Could have done, but it would have been very autocratic to do that. And I think your criticisms then would have been really valid, uh, levelled against me. No, I wouldn't have voted for that, I can I tell mean, you. Th this Conservative government hasn't been afraid of any autocratic measures in recent years. It's just thinking back to 2020, 2021. But look, let's talk about what's been going on in the House of Lords as well. We have that ping pong going on for weeks and weeks now regarding the safety of Rwanda bill. It's gone back to the House of Lords. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, we're, we're told by the end of today that'll be over, the ping pong should be over because the laws will have to accept the primacy of the elected accountable uh, House of Commons and it could be law by Friday. When do you expect planes to get off the ground? Well, the system that you've described is is exactly what every single bill uh, goes through. It's 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 proposed usually by the House of Commons. It's then delayed or, and revised by the House of Lords. It comes back to the House of Commons and that's how the system works. Now, I'm hopeful we've got four amendments that we're going to consider today. Maybe that will be the last of the ping pong. I don't know. But it is hope that this bill will be law by the end of the week. Uh, and when and when will planes get off the ground, do you think? We're told in spring. Well, uh, as you it's know, we're not we feeling very major... springy at the moment, to be fair. Uh, 
Um, it, 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 as you know, we had a major hearing in the Public Accounts Committee on Monday. There are certain things at the moment the government can't do for legal reasons until the bill is enacted, which hopefully will be by the end of the week. It will then be able to make those decisions. It will be a priority for the government, but I suspect it will take several weeks before the planes okay. actually get off the ground. Um, and just must ask you about uh, the, the question we're asking our audience today about Catherine Burble seeing dubbed Britain's strictest head teacher, also one of the most successful in terms of uh, uh, getting kids the results that they need to have a great life. Uh, she's won a high court battle against a Muslim people who challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals in the playground. Um, what's your reaction uh, to that high court victory for Burble's? Well, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted you've asked me about this because I was listening to your previous piece. And those parents knew perfectly well what the rules of that school were and they sent their children to that school because they know that that school and particularly the head mistress presides over a school that provides very good education so they knew what the rules were to try and then take your own school to the uh, high court seems to me to be uh, pretty uh, unobliging to say the least and i think that the judge was as you said in your previous clip sensible the decision is sensible and it will now enable that poor head teacher to get on with a normal job of teaching her should, uh, should her legal pupils. aid have been available to the the pupil and the pupil's mother to bring this sort of case against their school well that's a very difficult one as to when you provide uh, um, legal aid and when you don't provide legal aid um, i think in this country we generally regard uh, the judicial system as being there for people who want to take up grievances and that's why it's there and the judges are there to make uh, decisions one way or the other. I think it's a good use of our public money. I know a lot of our, well, our audience get getting I don't think it was particularly and there are provisions okay. I think where the judge could have disapplied the legal aid. Okay can I also ask you finally about this conference in Brussels, Conser National Conservatism Conference. It was attended by Nigel Farage. He was on stage when uh, uh, the police in Brussels were ordered by the socialist mayor to shut the conference down. They were already on their third venue, every other venue being told to not allow this conference to take place. Uh, the likes of Swella Braverman, uh, Liz Truss uh, uh, and, and others uh, speaking at this event. Miriam Cates, one of your colleagues, of course, also uh, on the Tory back benches. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Uh, we're told there were, you know, unsavoury far-right characters and therefore there was going to be a concern about there being uh, uh, some uh, physical rest on, on the outside. Um, was it right for the police to do that? Well, I, I think absolutely not. I think this is a very intolerant move by the mayor of that district. Um, I'm very surprised that it happened in a country that believes, as far as I'm aware, in free speech. These people were behaving in a perfectly civilised way. They weren't enticing people to riot or whatever. I think it's a very retrograde move when a major EU country starts to ban uh, conferences like this and, and, and clamp down on free speech. OK, thank you very much indeed. Appreciate you joining us. So Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, Conservative MP, thank you for that. Let's come back to Benedict Spence. Just on, on that final uh, conversation, just regarding that conference yeah. in Brussels, it, it, you and I were discussing a few moments ago, it is extraordinary how, how so many people, and it, it seems to me to be always people on the left, mm. uh, often on the far left, you know, and again, we talk about politics being left to right, and lots of people now say it's actually more of a circle where the far left and the far right kind of meet mm. with their sort of autocratic... Uh, for example, the Nazis, National Socialists, you know, they mm. meet, meet down in the middle. Um, but this urge to shut down anyone who says things they disagree with. And I get mm. people saying, why are you invited on question? Why do you have that woman on question time? I don't mm. like what she says. Are you supposed to agree with everyone on question time? Isn't that the point of the channel, of the I, show? I think in Europe especially, you're going to see a lot more clamping down on people yeah. with alternative ideas or slightly uh, right or left of centre ideas uh, because that is the fear of the centre, that is the fear of the establishment, which is that their policies have not worked very well. And it's not simply a UK issue. You look at the lack of growth and the major so developing social issues across Europe and you see actually stagnation, you see unhappiness, you see... Uh, 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 degrowth in some cases you see population decline and I think that this will be the um, the instinctive reaction is to go yeah. no no we can't risk allowing it to turn into something that we are not in control of we cannot allow it to be that alternative ideas are put forward because yeah. we will lose control on the system in general yeah. you'll see that in in Europe you're seeing it here as well to oh, a degree absolutely. yeah and this is not an unusual oh, thing all the but it's going to get on, worse. On, on our station the attacks on GB news as well mm. I mean it's just this urge to shut people down when people break the rules fair enough but actually you know there is not the same urge to shut down uh, when with, with the supposed rule breaking on BBC or mm. ITV or Sky News or anything else it is extraordinary mm.
uh, what what is happening on that front. But there we are. Mm. Oh look, let's go to um, let's go to your messages coming in about uh, the uh, head teacher uh, Catherine Burble Singh, dubbed Britain's strictest head teacher. She's won her high court battle uh, against the Muslim people who challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals, even though it's a clearly blatantly openly in its uh, in its constitution a secular school. I want to know your reaction. You can get in touch on the phone 0344 499 1000. You can send a WhatsApp to the same number. You can text 87222 and you can get in touch on X at Talk TV. Uh, your messages are coming in thick and fast. Karen says, well done. Once you bow to their demands, the demands won't stop coming. Brendan says, fantastic success. Well done. All schools should follow your example. I'm 70 years old and I had a strict school education and I loved my school. Keep up the good work. Uh, Danny says, that woman is a national hero. I have to say she is for me. I uh, would be very proud to have her in charge of my children's education and discipline in school hours. Sam says, well done to her. I wish the government had this kind of backbone to stand up for our country, our rules and our beliefs. Let's go to the phone lines now. Dave is on the line from, and he's in London. Good morning to you, Dave. Good morning, Julie. How are you? All right? Very well indeed. What do you make of this uh, High Court decision? I think it's absolutely superb. The only thing that really, really annoys me, I'm, and I'm so I'm 68 now. When I went to school, we got cane, we got things thrown at yeah. us, but we got respect. We have respect for the teachers, respect for your parents. The thing that annoys me about this is why did she get legal aid? When I'm paying for it, you're paying yeah. for it. And, and we're told it was a hundred. Well, Catherine Bevelstein claimed it was one hundred and thirty thousand pounds. The lawyers for the people who can't be identified because of her age um, say it was nothing like that. But it would have been in the tens of thousands. Of course, it would have. Yeah. Why, why do I have to pay for it? You know yeah. what I mean? Why, why should you pay for it? If you want to take someone to court yeah. for something like that, which I totally agree with this woman, um, I, I think you must. When you go to school, wherever you were, you've got to have respect for your governor, yeah. for, your, for your teachers. Why, if they want to take it to school, which is Sign all the things to say that you. This is what we do. This is what we don't yeah. do. If you don't want to send them to this school, then if you don't want to stick to these rules, then uh, uh, yeah, don't send them. Well, Catherine Bubble Singh says all, all pupils before they're allowed to uh, enrol at the school, the parents have to attend two meetings where the ethos of the school, the rules of the schools are explained. They have to sign a document saying they sign up to. You know, this is the deal. Sign up to it. There are so many faith schools of many, many different faiths in this country, and certainly uh, where this is in Brent, I'm sure there are plenty of schools of the Muslim faith, if someone wants to, uh, 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 this is a big issue for them in terms of their child's prayer. I mean, surely, you know, you're in a free country. I mean, I don't actually think faith schools should exist. I don't like for your children being segregated by faith, but they're entitled to send their kid to a faith school. And yet apparently they want to send the younger sibling to the same school. Yeah, I totally agree because if if you you've got they're saying this the country we we got a mix with people you know we've got different religions this that and the other if they want to say their prayers they go home and say their prayers if they want to go to a mosque they say that but to, to actually sign up for something that you can't do then charge yeah. us yourself the guy sitting next to you um, is ridiculous yeah absolutely I couldn't agree with you more on that day thank you very much I have to say I feel the same way whether it was any other religion as well I, I it doesn't matter what the religion is in this case anyway ten forty five is the time uh, up next. Next, we are going to be talking about, well, the trans issue, trans ideology in sport. We had the culture secretary represent sport as well yesterday, uh, demanding uh, that uh, sports bodies in this country keep women's sport just for women. We've got a new poll uh, saying that actually, what a surprise, that's backed by female athletes. That's up next. This is Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
Might, might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning to you. Thank you very much for joining me. It's uh, 10.49. I'm Julia hartley Burr here on Talk and uh, still joined by Benedict Spence in the studio. Uh, let's talk now about what trans ideology. Been in the news an awful lot, has it not? But we've been talking about this on the show, I mean, since I started at 10 a.m. in March 2016. Yes, all that time ago. Um, but uh, yesterday we had the Culture Secretary, Lucy Fraser, who's also uh, covering sport as part of her remit, uh, calling on national sports chiefs to, well, stop men competing in women's sports. Everyone says female and male. No, it's really simple. No men in women's sports. We invented women's sports for a reason. It's because men have an unfair physical advantage. Doesn't matter what you do to them in their pre-puberty, post-puberty, they have a physical advantage and it means that they're, let's face it, cheating when they compete against women. Uh, well, let's talk about this right now to Fiona McEnana. Uh, she's Director of Sport at Fair Play for Women. Uh, good morning to you. Good morning, Julia. Thank you. Actually, I'm at Sex Matters now. You're at Sex Matters. I do apologise. That you used to be at Fed Paper. I do apologise. Got wrong information there on the on the on the uh, list here. Um, but I mean, again, two fantastic organisations doing wonderful work and uh, uh, and, uh, and 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 really fighting on women's behalf on this. Um, you've got a new survey, haven't you? Uh, where showing that a majority of female athletes support categorising sports, uh, sporting uh, competitions by biological sex rather than gender identity, i.e. how a man feels on any particular day, when there's any contact or any endurance. Uh, it's the largest survey of uh, was 175 uh, world-class, elite and national level female athletes, and 58% said, you know, that actually, you know, the principle should be women should compete against women and men should compete against men. When did this even become controversial? Yes, well, actually, this is an academic paper that's been published, so people are actually studying this um, and as you say, there's a majority of women who want fairness for themselves. The interesting thing is that uh, it, when they're asked about their own sport, those numbers go up to almost 80%. Yeah. So basically, everybody wants fair this, fairness for themselves, um, but they feel under pressure, one imagines, to say, well, we need to accommodate or other people can accommodate. Uh, and, and we know this, Julia, that whenever... Um, a sport has has surveyed its own members and the number of sports have done this now um they always get 80 percent plus yeah. who say the female category has to be for those born female yeah. there's no other way to keep it fair for women and girls yeah, and this ab is absolutely i mean again it's, it's not complicated and even get whether people say well it's not a contact sport like rugby or you know our own boxing but actually you know endurance sports whether it's running whether it's cycling or whether it's swimming 
Men have a huge advantage. They're on average, they are bigger. They are on average an awful lot stronger, broader shoulders, bigger hands, longer legs. Um, the, the, the muscle, just the muscle percentage of their body is higher. Once you've got testosterone levels and you can take as many hormones as you want and you, when you decide you're going to live your life as a trans woman, you will still have a huge testosterone and physical advantage over women. Um, we know all this. I mean, we don't really need any more studies of this. I mean, Sharon Davies, the wonderful Sharon Davies, has, has written, uh, you know, a, a whole book about this, and all this evidence is known. And it seems to me that no one ever really thought to ask the women athletes. I mean, we, we saw the women having to compete against, you know, the swimmer Leah Thomas. You know, he was 400 in, in, in college swimming uh, as a man, and then just basically grew his hair, changed his name. Suddenly he's winning by a mile even though he's wandering around with his tackle out in the women's changing room. And, and not even, I mean, there wasn't even any proper pretense that he was in any way living as a woman. I mean, it's just been, it's been making a mockery of women, hasn't it? Well, you're exactly right that there was no real consultation of women. I mean, these, these policies were all adopted starting around about 2013 and rolled on all through for, for years. And as you know, Julia, it's taken an awful lot of work from women to try yeah. and even get it back on the table, to try and take back what was originally created for us. Um, and now there's all this endless consultation as if it's controversial. Yeah. Um, and, and that was never the case when these policies were adopted. So, you know, I find it quite frustrating that these kind of um, academic studies or surveys are even being done, because I think we have to stop asking women and girls to solve the problem of what to do where these these men with a transgender identity want to do sport. Yeah. Sports have to solve that, but women and girls don't have to solve it. Yeah, we need women right shouldn't be them. thrown under a bus. And it's not just at elite level, is it? This is happening in, you know, college level. It is happening in, you know, the, the you know, the park runs where the you know the women's record, the women's race has been constantly won by men let's call them what they are men um and who would have no chance of winning the men's race um and uh, you know average men beating exceptional women is cheating i'm sorry it's as simple as that and it's happening in schools as well yes and it's very demoralizing in schools it's it's desperate and it is as you say at all levels and why that matters is how do any of us progress through the levels to get to be competitive or or international or professional if you don't have school sport, college club sport yeah. all the way through. So it, it is devastating. And we hear all the time, and Sharon will have told you too, Davis, all the time from um, parents and from, from girls themselves about how demoralizing it is yeah. and how they even feel, you know, at risk of being injured. You know, football yes. is a huge problem, huge problem, because that is a contact sport. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know why there is a belief that the feelings of these male players matter more than the feelings of the girls. But yeah. that, that seems to be the position and this real fear again lots of women and girls they want to be people to think they're nice no one wants to be called a bigot or a transphobe and so they go along with it um and again I, it, everyone says well maybe we could have a separate category which is a trans category well yes that will still be won by men um <laughs> either way it'll just be average men winning it not exceptional men uh fiona McNenna, uh formerly of, of uh, as i say of a uh, uh, fair play for women but now at sex matters two fantastic organizations fighting for women's rights and safety so appreciate you're joining us a uh, quick word uh, from benedict spence on this honestly it's just uh, do you know what ever since the cast report also came out and you see the doubling down of some people you know and even when faced with sort of evidence and we see this don't we with comes to women's sports and you think about the physical differences and all of this time it's been known and yet yeah. still there are people like the japanese soldiers in the jungle who refuse to sort of you know come yes. you know, come back come back out into civilization on this and you usually just think i mean that's the key thing isn't it it's the physical differences threatening yeah. injury to the key, people the key what thing the key is thing is women and girls need to say and parents of the girls need to say no no it's cheating full stop no women are not going to bow down to this thank you very much benedict spence oh, loads more to come here on talk tv Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Was the woke that was. We've got Pete Barnes, we've got Lois Perry, and we've got the author of Gender Madness, all in London. And we've got someone I don't like. <laughs> Good morning and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brewer. You are with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live between 10 and 1. Coming up in this hour, nearly half of Tory MPs refused to back the Prime Minister's smoking ban last night. The legislation passed a key vote with the backing of Labour MPs, but 59 Tories voted against the measure and 106 abstained. And Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron has landed in Israel this morning for talks with the country's leaders. Yesterday, the Prime Minister here urged Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to show calm in response to Iran's drone and missile attack this weekend. And the strictest head teacher in Britain, Catherine Burbel Singh, has won a legal battle against her by a Muslim pupil after the High Court ruled that her school's prayer ban was both legitimate and proportionate to maintain the secular character and ethos of the Michaela Community School. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. First, though, let's get the latest news headlines with Divya Kohli. This is Talk TV News. Good morning. The Foreign Secretary is in Israel to discuss its response to Iran's weekend drone and missile strikes. Lord Cameron has joined calls by the US and the EU to place restrictions on Iran, but is urging Israel not to retaliate with force. Former Defence Minister Sir Gerald Howarth told Talk TV if Iran's strikes weren't intercepted, they could have had grave consequences. 30 cruise missiles. Imagine that happening to the United Kingdom. I mean, this could have caused untold damage uh, in uh, Israel had it, and loss of life had it not been for the effectiveness of the ground-based air defense which uh, Israel has and 
the spontaneous support of its allies, the United States, United Kingdom, France and Jordan. The Prime Minister's major plan to phase out smoking is one step closer to coming into law. Despite some opposition, the proposals to ban smoking among youngsters passed its first hurdle in the Commons last night. Rishi Sunak wants to raise the legal age each year in a bid to phase out the habit as well as restrict the sales of vapes. On the street, there's been mixed reaction. Yeah, it's good because kids can't smoke then, can they? But people do get people to go to the shop, don't they, to buy them, so it's not really going to stop anyone, is it? And I personally think cigarettes can't be banned. People will go mad. I think it does set a good example. I think it's good. It prevents a lot of younger people from smoking in the future. Inflation has fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years as cost of living pressures continue to ease. Inflation fell from 3.4 to 3.2 percent in March, meaning what we pay for goods and services is rising at a slower rate. The Office for National Statistics says food prices was one of the major contributing factors. The Chancellor Jeremy Hunt says the plan is working. Inflation is falling faster than expected. There are growing calls to outlaw smacking in England and in Northern Ireland. Children's doctors say the laws as they stand are dangerously vague and have published a report warning hitting children at home can cause lasting mental and physical effects. Smacking kids is already illegal in Scotland and in Wales. The Sydney shopping centre that was the scene of a deadly stabbing attack will open tomorrow for a community reflection day, allowing people to come and pay their respects. Six people were killed on Saturday, including a new mum. The mall's owners say they're tightening security going forward. And Taylor Swift fans have been conned out of more than a million pounds by scammers selling fake tickets for her current tour. Lloyds Bank has been analysing reports from more than 600 customers who thought they were buying tickets for her era's tour. On average, they lost more than £300 each, but some of them lost more than 1000 Consumer rights expert Martin James told us this is an easy scam aimed at fans who would have missed out on buying tickets. It's a huge, huge scam at the moment. Loads and loads are being affected. Frauds like this play on people's demand and their desire um, to show their fandom and their support for the artists that they love. That's the latest Weather Time Now with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, blustery out there once again for today, particularly the further east you are near the area of low pressure that's working its way southwards, bringing plenty of showers across the eastern side of the UK today. And some inland showers are likely, but the heaviest and most thundery ones will be across parts of the east where it will be feeling cool. Temperatures are only up into the high single figures. Out towards the west, some good amounts of sunshine up into double figures, 12 degrees Celsius at best. But across parts of Northern Ireland, the east of the Republic and later western parts of Wales and southwest England, there will be showery rain through this afternoon but going into tonight a lot of the showers will clear away southwards and that rain out in the west so it will be largely dry and clear the winds will become lighter as well so it will be colder compared to the last few nights and in some rural spots especially around England and Wales a frost is likely there will also be cloud wind and rain starting to approach the northwest of the UK that's the no next low pressure system that will bring showery spells of rain across much of Scotland and Northern Ireland through tomorrow then later Northern England the north of Wales and parts of the Midlands the far south though should stay mostly fine and bright and yet again it will be another cool day temperatures up to 10 degrees celsius times radio sponsors talk tv weather Good morning. Uh, this is Julia hartley Brill with you on a Talk. Uh, we're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And joining me in the studio, delighted to say, as with every Wednesday, is Benedict Spence, who's a Conservative commentator, but not so Conservative that you were invited to that conference in Brussels that got shut down. Sadly, I'm not hard right enough. Hard right, hard right. Yeah. No, or, or <laughs> as, Kay Burley, as Kay Burley called them uh, this morning, unsavoury characters. Oh, I'm definitely an unsavoury character. Yeah, that's true. Just, you know, it's definitely an unsavoury character. Just not quite the right kind of unsavoury, unsavory. clearly. I don't what do you, what do you mean? Of, of that conference it was a national conservatism i hate that word yeah. conservatism conference um nigel farage uh, was was actually on stage when the socialist mayor sent the police in 
uh, mm. to try and close it down. They decided there were three officers they probably wouldn't, but they decided to put a circle of steel uh, mm. around uh, this venue. It's the third venue, by the way, for this conference, because yeah. they, they kept being shut down. Uh, you, know, you don't host this venue, we'll make life hard for you. Threats even made mm. to the, the, the venue owner's wife. I mean, extraordinary mm. stuff going on. Um, and then people weren't allowed out, so mm. they wouldn't allow caterers in, so no one had any food. If you went out, you couldn't get in. Some of the speakers who were due to speak couldn't get in. Mm. But we had, you know, um, you know Miriam Cates, very sound conservative MP uh, in this country. Swella Bradman, our former Home Secretary, for goodness sake. Uh, we, we had leaders of major political parties in Europe we were likely to win the European elections, mm. as Nigel Farage pointed out. Viktor Orban, the Hungarian Prime Minister, due to speak later this week. Um, I don't agree with Viktor Orban on a lot of things. He's probably quite a nasty piece of work. But he's democratically elected. Mm. Um, the idea that a socialist mayor of some, let's face it, Tim Pop, city in Belgium. <laughs> in a Timport city, a Timport mayor in a Timport city, in a Timport country in mm. Europe gets to have a say over whether or not politicians from this country or any other can speak completely, you know, normal mainstream mm. political views mm. uh, or be faced being shut down. Because it's an extraordinary attack on freedom of speech. It is. Just on an unrelated note, are you saying it's a Timport country? Belgium has done very well out of the European Union, hasn't oh, it? Oh, haven't they just? But I think, you know, it is... As, as, as also, you say, they brought us mayonnaise with chips. So, well done. Thanks for your contribution to the world. Yes, and chocolate. Okay, that's three things. Okay, well, that's <laughs> it. What, what have the Romans, Belgians ever done for us? What have the Romans ever done for us? Gone off on a slight tangent. I do you um, like mayo with chips? <laughs> it's, it is good. Yeah, they were onto something, weren't they? Maybe they aren't. Anyway, anyway. Have we got off the track? Yeah, I we, think have. we have. It wasn't a reason this is to the stay. Quality. You don't get this on Radio 4. You absolutely don't. Now, they'll be discussion. talking about the life cycle of a butterfly right now. The uh, greater spotted Belgian butterfly. That's what it would be. Um, Honestly, I mean, it's a sign, I think, of the, the the lack of confidence in certain, certainly amongst the centre, I think, across yeah. Europe and the centre-left, that there is this kind of whack-a-mole approach to shutting down Conservative conferences. Um, none of it is to be applauded at all. Obviously, it's disgraceful that it has, because, as you said, a lot of the people who are speaking it are perfectly mainstream. One of them is but, an elected head of an yeah. EU member but, state. But even if they weren't, right? yeah. you, see, you talk about centre... I don't think the idea, you know, the centrist dad thing. Yeah, I don't yeah. think what well, where where so many people in Europe and and America and the UK think that what is centrist. Mm. I don't think it's centrist anymore. I think it's actually remarkably far left and authoritarian. Mm. Yeah, I think also though, and this is the thing that slightly you know strikes me is that, you know the desire to shut down these conferences. Mm. The fact that there are so many of them is to me a sign that there is a real crisis of confidence or ideas on the right in Europe. And we see that in the fact that the Conservative Party have gone left wing. They have so yeah. few ideas uh, over the last few, few years. So what's the threat exactly? That they might be able to organise themselves into having a conference and they all turn up on time? Because that would be a start. You know, yeah. Is there really well, that the, the chance that they're all going to sort of manifest into a com you know, competent you know, coalition of people? I don't think <laughs> well, so. Except we do know a lot of those, uh, I mean, again, they're called far right, hard right mm. uh, you know, characters. Again, a lot, a lot of these parties are just, you know, conservative parties with mm. a small c. Uh, they are centre-right parties. They have policies like not having unlimited illegal or, or legal migration to their countries. I mean, this is not controversial policy to most people. It's not even a left-right thing. Mm. It is extraordinary how much the Everton window has shifted mm. uh, in terms of, you know, what is considered to be, you know, normal or not. Um, I, I, I do find that absolutely extraordinary. But anyway, we shall... Um, uh, you know, we shall wait and see what happens because obviously they're going to carry on with this conference. Mm. Um, but um, you know, again, finding another venue, uh, the socialist mayor has been sort of criticised uh, even even by sort of other EU leaders. So that is a begin a start, and even by Rishi Sunak, which I thought was good, although mm. interestingly not by Labour. Uh, here. Uh, we have seen, um, I think Jonathan Ashworth was doing an interview and he was asked about this last night and he was just sort of going, ha ha, you know, yeah, this is going to shut down. But the thing is, you know, be careful what you wish for. I don't ever need someone mm. whose views that I disagree with to be shut down because I'm perfectly capable. And I felt this about Nick Griffin going on mm. from the BNP going on Question Time. I always argue these people should be given a platform and it's amazing when these people are given a platform how quickly their power completely dissipates because mm. because actually they haven't got anything useful or sensible to say. I mean, as you say, nobody wants... Well, we shouldn't want BMP meetings to be broken up because, as you said, when they went on question, Chime, uh, Nick Griffin went on and everybody heard what they had to say, well, it all collapsed.
conference. Now, now there's only about seven of them. That would be the conference if it were to have one. It's not worth breaking up. Um, I think you're completely right. It's about the disinfectant of, a, of, a, of attention, actually. When people hear bad ideas actually being put out there in the public sphere, they don't just sort of always nod and go, oh, yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. this is justified. There are a few things, obviously, and I think that the Labour Party indulges rather a lot of them. It's interesting, therefore, that they're not saying, you know, that Sir Keir Starmer has not come out and condemned this because he doesn't want to come out, you know, down on one side of the fence or, or otherwise because that's his thing, say as little yeah, as possible. Exactly. But yesterday, I think it was Annalise Dodds talking about how Britain was a bad environment for uh, black and ethnic minority businesses and you're thinking so there are some sorts of extremism that you will indulge in and you know playing race relations to try oh, to divide people absolutely. you're fine with that that's absolutely. okay Always. whereas if a right-wing person did that oh boy can uh, you imagine the absolutely. backlash absolutely this is extraordinary isn't it um benedict um, let's also talk about um this victory we talked about it already quite a lot but it's, i do think it's a fantastic victory in the high court a uh, britain's strictest head teacher catherine burble saying won this high court battle yesterday against a muslim pupil who has challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals um i'm asking you the audience the question as well now by the way if you are watching on the telly box uh, you'll, you'll still be looking at the, the wonderful, wonderful visage of Benedict Spence rather than me. But if you could just mind while I'm speaking, we'll just pretend it's you. <laughs> Do get in touch. <laughs> Oi, Bay. Uh, give us a call. A three. I feel that this show has already gone horribly wrong. <laughs> Should we give up now? Uh, give it went us a wrong call. when I got here. Yeah, That's yeah, it totally did. Around Sorry 10 o'clock, yeah. Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. Text on 87222. Uh, you can get in touch on X at Talk TV as well. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, I just want to know what your reaction is to this. Um, seems to me, it might mean, certainly my reaction is, why did this kid get legal aid? Why the hell does the mum want to challenge the school when she chose to send her kid to a non-faith school? Why does the mum want to send her younger sibling of the child to mm. uh, to the school as well? Um, why um, and, 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 and why why on earth did anyone find this necessary to do? Legal aid, I suppose, because everybody gets legal aid in this country who needs legal aid, and whether or not it's a justified case to be brought is a separate point. But everybody seems to get legal aid, and that's a separate question. I mean, the the, the hilarity of, of the parent also having enrolled the child. So clearly it is a major enough issue for this parent and this child to go to the court and to take tens of thousands of pounds in legal aid, but it's not actually such a major issue that they would consider taking their child out of the school or sending their actual child to a, a different school. So there seems to be a bit of a disconnect there and actually how important this should be. But I'm very happy to see that you know the result is as it is because actually this school's results have been fantastic for you know, deprived, underprivileged people from they all kinds of backgrounds. They are off the scale. This is yeah. the best school in terms of results from sort of what mm. people's arrive with their ability uh, and their likely achievement to what they actually achieve. Under Britain's sort Nines of standard, across the board. under Britain's sort of standard comprehensive education system, many of these people, many of these no. children, would have just fallen through the craps, and it Absolutely. would have been accepted. It would have been tolerated, and people would have gone for the sake of the comprehensive system. This is a good thing that this has happened. She has turned that on its head with discipline and with sense of harmony, and people focused and working all together in the same direction. Having these sorts of, dispat uh, of disputes and spats deliberately tries to undermine that. So it's fantastic, actually, that you know, people have seen sense and said yeah. this is something that can't Absolutely. be allowed. Well, I want to hear from you. Do get in touch. Um, 0344 499 1000 is the number to call to get in touch. Lots of texts and tweets coming in. Very few calls coming in on this. I know we all talked about the legal aid centers, but I really want to hear from you. Maybe you agree with the pupil and actually, well, you know what? You should have the right uh, to have Muslim prayer rituals. How does that impact on other people? Uh, maybe it's another religious uh, uh, ritual that should be allowed in the school. I really do want to hear from you. Get in touch, 0344 499 1000. You may also want to get in touch. We talked about this yesterday on the show, but a lot of people still wanting to talk about this. The smoking ban vote last night in the House of Commons. Interestingly, I mean, pretty much half of Tory MPs last night did not support the Prime Minister. They either abstained or they voted against the actual measure uh, to ban smoking from some, anyone who was born from 1st of January 2009 onwards. So if you're 15 now, you're never legally going to be allowed to buy cigarettes. Um, Benedict, we spoke to um, Geoffrey Clifton-Brown, a Tory MP, who's very much in favour of personal freedom and choice, very much, uh, very much anti-smoking, and basically voted for the measure. Although mm. again, so not that keen, not that keen on freedom of choice, and, and, and it seems to me, I'm, I, you won't find a more avid anti-smoker than me. Yeah. And yet it seems to me this measure is wrong in terms of, 
it, people say it's about tackling smoking for children. It's already illegal to smoke as a child. This is yes. about adults. But now we're going to make it extra illegal. I mean, I, I saw yesterday another Conservative MP, Laura Farris, saying that because of her personal experience of smoking when she was younger and people she had spoken to and you know, said, nobody who I know who smoked uh, has ever had anything but regret for it. And she said at the end of the interview, I forget where it was, something along the lines of, I'm not interested in listening to discussions on personal freedom on this. And it was just such a sort of a, yeah. that's the modern Tory party in a nutshell. It talks the good game oh, about free yeah. markets and freedoms and all that sort of thing. But when it comes down to it, they're not interested in that at all. They think they know better than you by virtue of the fact that they've become MPs in a fundamentally closed system in, a, yeah. in that political party which they've got to the top through patronage largely. They think that they are better than you, that they know better than you, and they've spoken to other people who just happen to reinforce their yes, own biases. Right. I know people who um, love smoking. Yeah. And they, and they genuinely have said, it's a no-brainer. I'm... I, it's, it's, it's the, the single biggest thing you can do for mm. your health. The single biggest thing is not smoking. Or if you're smoking, giving up smoking. Mm. Vaping, it's not ideal, it's not good for you, but it's, well, they reckon, about 95% safer than smoking. So mm. that is a clear... And I've seen... I mean, there are millions of people in recent years who have moved to vaping. So, I mean, I think our NHS has actually been more sensible than some other countries actually mm. you know, supporting vaping as, as a route out of smoking. But I, I am... I, I, I genuinely, I think it's a silly thing to do. I think yeah. it's a dumb thing to do. Um, and yes, there is a cost on the NHS, but there is also a cost on the NHS from obesity. Now, it seems to me, mm. there is no doubt at all in my mind that it is a slippery slope and inevitably it will be the case that the smoking ban comes in, it will be a laughing stock within a few years when you've got two adults, mm. who, one of whom can buy cigarettes, one of whom can't, who were born a day apart. Mm. And the response to that should be, oh, this law doesn't actually work, let's drop it. Mm. No, the response is going to be, with the public health bodies wagging their little fingers, the response is going to be, we should ban it for everybody. Mm. Now, I'd love it if no one smoked, but, you know, I'd love it if no one did heroin as well, but we've already got banned on heroin because it's not something that's widespread. I just, it seems to and me that yet. there are, lo yeah, there are <laughs> lots and lots of things that people do that I don't like or mm. I don't want to do myself, but I'm not entirely sure it's my sodding business what they choose to do with their own bodies. It's mm. my business if they're puffing smoke in my face, mm. in my office or on the bus, and we dealt with that in 2007. Mm. But it's not my business if someone wants to have a, go to an early grave by choosing to eat a lot, choose, or eating bad foods, mm. or choosing to smoke. I'm just not sure mm. that I have the right, or anyone else has the right, to dictate what that person can do. Yeah, or drinking. That's another one that kills an awful lot of people. And this is the thing it they say. Though, really. it, it doesn't, though, really. It does. It does. But do you know what actually kills a lot of people? Being alive, because something, <laughs> really bad gets you, for you. something gets you in the end. The big thing that people really don't pay attention to is sleep deprivation. That will kill you. That'll kill you a lot quicker. You know what kills you? you know, also loneliness. Yeah. We're going to legislate that people have to have a well, chat with someone every exactly. day Exactly, and well. this is when people say, oh, it costs the NHS X, Y, Z. No, the NHS exists so that people will use it because yep. everybody gets yeah, ill. You shouldn't go skiing. You yep. shouldn't go horse riding. You shouldn't do any. You couldn't play rugby. You shouldn't do anything that means you might have to go to hospital. Look, mm -hmm. we had this during 2020 and 2021. Oh, hospitals are overloaded, so don't do anything that means you might have to go to hospital. Funnily enough, people still get ill. I know people who've never smoked a cigarette in their life mm. who, who, who've had lung cancer. Yeah. I mean, you know, people still get ill. It, 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 again, your odds are worse. It is a dumb thing to do for your health. But the thing is, it's this idea that the public health waggy, finger-waggy people, who, by the way, never look very happy or healthy. Have you noticed that? Because they, they haven't banned everything they yet. Do, <laughs> yeah, they don't look like the happiest people. They're not people thinking, God, I hope they come on Saturday night. Mm. Um, these are the people who, who really, they kind of disapprove of sugar and, and, and eating too much meat. They don't like fast food. They're the sort of people like that doctor who wrote that absurd book about uh, super processed foods who seems mm. to think that, you know, having a pizza you bought from a supermarket for four quid mm. is, un is absolutely beyond the pale and is going to kill you. But a pizza that's made from sourdough, his local fancy schmancy Italian, mm. uh, you know, diner, that's, that's absolutely healthy. These people are, I mean, they... Uh, they're, they're, they're just they're just snobs. I think under they're the just yeah. controlly waggy finger snobs. Yeah, uh, I mean under the definition of processed food, you shouldn't eat kimchi or sauerkraut or things like that. Things well, you should because it's horrible. Well, yes, but that's not why they say you shouldn't no. eat them. And they would probably say actually, but you know the poor taste. Why is kimchi anyway? I mean, it took me years to get my cabbage. Well, anyway, it took it me years to get my my head round quinoa. Uh, fermented cabbage. Does anybody think that that's going to kill you? It might kill you of boredom or you know horror having to eat it every day, but it's not actually going to kill you. And yet it meets the definition of processed food.
food. And that's yeah. how you know that it's a bit of a nonsense when they say ultra processed food can be this, this yeah. and this. It means all sorts of things. But ultimately, yeah. also we're talking about a ban here. Yeah. Since when does bans on these sorts of things work? Did prohibition actually work in the United yeah. States? When the United States put bans on the importation of Cuban cigars, did the people who like to smoke Cuban cigars yeah, suddenly exactly. just not do it? No, they found ways around it. Yeah. It's not going to but work. But also, people have a choice. I, mean, I, I make an active choice every single day to spend a couple of years less in a care home in my 90s uh, by <laughs> choosing to have a very nice glass of wine or fizz mm. uh, with, uh, with my dinner. Um, and and, and, and I, I'm sorry, there's simply no evidence that that is going to kill me. But if that is, but if that is the choice, it's a choice I'm willing to make. I'm but, not get, I'm not drinking a bottle of vodka every night. But equally, if you had one, okay, if you had one cigarette a day after dinner, that isn't going to cause you the sort of the damage that you're told it is. Yeah. Actually, everything in moderation, even demonstrably bad things, are yeah. fine. I don't know if people are aware of this. Yeah. You can eat a little bit of chocolate, and it's not going to kill you. Benedict in moderation. It's what all the girls That'll say. That'll kill you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <was gonna> <laughs> um, let's also talk uh, about Megan. Let's talk about, yeah, something that would kill you is eating <laughs> basically a jar of sugar, which is what jam is. But Megan uh, Markle, um, Duchess of Sussex, she does like, sorry, Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Sussex. Uh, she is launching the first product in her new lifestyle brand range, which is named because she has just chosen three random words that have nothing to do with each other, literally picked names at random, American, Riviera, Orchard. Um, can, can, by the way, can you text in and message in with your suggestions for a lifestyle brand for me? Um, oh, that's going to go wrong, isn't it? That's going to go horribly wrong. Anyway, she's making jam. Americans call it jelly, don't they? Um, strawberry, strawberry jam. It's not even... It's not even like some exotic jam. What we were saying, like mm. fig and lychee or of all the things, kale jam or I don't know. Dragon fruit or something. You know, you were expecting oh, something. Dragon fruit would work. You were expecting, you know, very fitting. You'd be expecting something a bit more Hollywood, something a bit more, you know, sort of uh, LA elite sort of thing that might make people go, oh, that's exciting. But no, strawberry, strawberry jam. it's just sugar. It's, you know, it's going to put more pressure on the yeah, NHS. Think... It's very unpatriotic for her to do that. Awful. But honestly, American Orchard, Riviera, Riviera Orchard. No, you see, you've got it exactly. So, so it's just random I'm words. trying to picture it. Just apple trees by by a Florida beach. It's, it just sounds in awful. A, in America? Yeah. <laughs> just, what is it? I know, I know. It, it just, I mean, again, she'd have had people, she'd have, she would have had people deciding mm. this. Anyway, they're telling me to move on. How do you not think that <laughs> Megan launching her American Riviera Orchard strawberry jam isn't the biggest story in the world right now? What is wrong? <laughs> Sack the entire production team. You don't know a story when it's in your face. We're hijacking the show. This is, this is the this top is it. The This is it. Lock the doors. <laughs> We're going to talk about this for it's the next hour and a half. It's not a coup. It's just what the people want. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to talk about this anymore. We're going to move on. Uh, let's get to your text and tweets. been coming in thick and fast about uh, Catherine Burbel Singh winning that high court battle against a Muslim pupil who challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals. I want to know what your reaction is other than just she is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Also bad for you, apparently. Well, I don't know. Uh, do get in touch. Give us a call at uh, 0344 499 1000. You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Um, Tom has done just that. Prayer ban on legal aid. Ridiculous. I mean, you hope the parent has to pay back the money it costs to the taxpayer. Yeah, shouldn't you have to pay it back if you lose? It's not like a life or death thing. We're not talking about like the. the, the... There's a case, there's a story mm. in the news, Benedict, today. Mm. Um, and it's, it's regarding. Um, Paedophiles, it's people who've, people who've raped children under 13. Mm. I mean, literally the most heinous people on the planet in this country, losing automatically their, their parental rights, so not having a say of what happens to their children or access to their children, <coughs> uh, even when they're behind bars. Mm. Um, mm. Uh, uh, I mean, I can't think of a more sensible law. That's a ban I'm fully behind. Mm. But uh, the mum in the case that actually sparked this and got Harriet Harman to bring this in as an amendment in, in a government bill, um, she she had to get her parents to remortgage their home to afford to do this this case. So you get legal aid mm. for a prayer ban at school, mm. but not to stop your child having to spend time with a man who has raped other children. Mm. What is going on in this country? I mean, what I would say is that since David Cameron became Prime Minister under the Conservatives, the Ministry of Justice underwent 40% cuts. And I think when you see that yeah, kind of everything. shortfall, there will be a lot of mistakes made, yeah, a absolutely. lot of bad policy. Um, let's get some more of these messages on uh, Catherine Bevel Singh, though. Jim says the head teacher is absolutely right. Diversity and inclusion are opposites. We should be encouraging what unites us and not giving in to every minority obsession. Vicky says, I'm with the head teacher. If you don't like school rules, take your child elsewhere that has lower standards. 
John says, let them pray. If it was a Christian student, this would not be an issue. I'm pretty sure it wouldn't harm anyone. Um, I think the point is that Christian students weren't aren't sort of they're saying required under their religion to to pray, you know, at lunchtime to pray five times a day. Um, again, I feel the same way um, as an atheist. I feel the same way about any religion. If you've gone, if you want, if you feel strongly about that, go to one of the literally thousands of Christian schools. Um, Thomas says, I'd make her PM. Oh, totally. Uh, she seems to have excellent standards and morals, which are sorely missing in today's education system. Bravo. Tell you what, Thomas, she also has a sodding backbone. Don't see much of that these days, do we? Uh, let's uh, take a call now. Joe is in Bournemouth. Good morning to you, Joe. Good morning. Thank you very much for calling in. What do you want to say? Well, you just sort of touched on it, really. My main concern about this scenario, and probably quite a few others, is the parameters around legal aid nowadays. Oh. Because Tell that, to me, is the biggest problem that we're facing right now. Is You know, people who work hard can't get any legal aid and can't do anything, whereas you seem to be able to take people to court for yeah. God knows what. And then there's a lot of money to be made by solicitors. Solicitors are rubbing their hands together, aren't they, oh. the lawyers? I mean, whenever we have any case at all, things, anything on these sort of issues, you know, human rights issues, you know, uh, the, it's the lawyers who get the majority of the money. Now, they've said it wasn't a £130,000 cost, as Catherine Burble Singh said in her statement, but it would have been in the tens of thousands. And as the previous caller pointed out, we paid for that. Well, also, we're paying for the defence of the school. Yep. So there's, there's both bills coming to the taxpayer. Yeah, I'm wondering if they did it under... In, I think I think Catherine Burble said when this case came up, I think she said they, they had insurance, I think, to cover these sort of cases. But schools... But I don't even want a head teacher who is delivering for kids from some of the poorest, most deprived backgrounds to be spending a minute of her time dealing with this sort of nonsense rather than getting her kids the edu best education that she can deliver for them. Well, from what I'm hearing, it sounds like a lot of heads could learn from this one. She seems very good. Uh, uh, would you? I mean, if you lived in that local area, would you want to send your kids there? I'd imagine so. It's yeah. a bit strict rule that gives good results at the end of the day. Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it funny? How, we're always told like, oh no, but you know, kids get free expression and everything. You're not even allowed to talk in the corridors there because she wants kids arriving calm, ready for the next lesson. But it delivers the results, and the kids. I've seen spoken to loads of people who visited that school. The kids are really happy. And maybe we wouldn't have so many problems in the country with us youngsters if a lot of schools were like that. 100%. Couldn't agree with you more there, Joe. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, coming up um, after the break, more from Benedict Spence. Sorry about that. Uh, no, we're also going to... <laughs> I'm just being horrible Couldn't now. It's just, it's just <laughs> bullying now. Um, we're also going to be talking about what is going on in the Middle East. Lord Cameron, our Foreign Secretary, has arrived in Israel this morning for meetings with Netanyahu and others. But what will Israel's response be to that attack by Iran at the weekend? And what should it be? That's up next. This is Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> for, yeah. been, for, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning to you, um, Julia Hartley Brewer. This is a talk at TV. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. Uh, let's turn our attention now to what's happening in the Middle East. Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, has arrived in Israel this morning. Uh, he is having meetings with Benjamin Netanyahu and other leading figures in Israel, where we are understanding that he is uh, going to uh, be urging the country to show, as uh, Rishi Sunak said in a phone call to Netanyahu yesterday, calm in response to Iran's drone and missile attack at the weekend. Well, let's talk about this now with Jake Wallace-Simons. He's the editor of the Jewish Chronicle. Uh, he's also the author of Israelophobia, the newest version of the oldest hatred and what to do about it. Good morning to you, Jake. Good morning. Um, we, we've seen around the world, we've seen you, Joe Biden, you know, this bizarre phone call to Netanyahu, take the win um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the thank thankfully, the lack of uh, you know, death and destruction as a result of that unprecedented Iranian missile and drone attack at the weekend, uh, thanks to the Iron Dome and indeed, of course, help from allies, including, interestingly, Jordan. Uh, but um, we know there's going to have to be a reaction. I don't think anyone realistically thinks that Iran can launch an assault like that on civilian targets in Israel and that Israel does not respond. What would be an appropriate, but as Rishi Sunak says, calm response to that attack that would perhaps not escalate things even more in the Middle East? Well, it seems like from Sunak's point of view, and indeed from President Biden's point of view, the correct response would be no response at all. They seem to want the Israelis to play only defence. And of course, the Israelis won't do that because that would establish a new normal under which Iran would do it again and expect the, you know, the Israelis not to respond. So Israel has to respond. But it needs to keep its allies on board, given that they are calling for restraint. But also it needs to avoid escalating into an all out war. Uh, but most importantly, it needs to enforce a painful deterrent that will prevent Iran from doing this again. And that's a difficult calibration. Get it wrong and it could trigger a war, but it has options. You know, one option is, for example, to uh, to launch some covert strikes that are deniable from within Iran. We know that Mossad's capabilities are extensive in uh, in Iran. There are also cyber options as well. Uh, but I think that it's more likely that we'll see a strike from Israeli territory into Iran, which will more closely mirror the Iranian aggression and therefore act as a more direct deterrent, or perhaps a combination of all three things. Now, in terms of targets, um, I think that we could likely expect to see some weapons factories and facilities targeted, particularly ones that have been providing drones and other weapons for Russia to use in Ukraine. I mean, that would be a service to the West as well. It would help to keep the alliance strong. So I think that's quite likely that we might see a strike on Iran's nuclear facilities. That's, I think, less likely, but it's a possibility given that they are making rapid progress towards the bomb. And once they are nuclearized, then it's an entire game changer yeah. and the world suddenly a much more dangerous place. Or we could see uh, targeted strikes against individuals, you know, maybe the head of the, Re the Revolutionary Guards, his deputy, the commander of the armed forces, and so on. And there's a big difference, isn't there, between there being civilian and military targets. And and it is extraordinary to me that the urge for, you know, to, to you know, not respond or to respond in a very, very low, very measured way to what was a huge upgrading of the response from Iran. Um, you know, response to an attack uh, on on the, the compound uh, of their, 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 their uh, embassy, in, well, the consulate in, in Damascus, in Syria, which killed only military uh, targets 
to respond but with with 300 plus drones and missiles across you know, civilian targets is a completely off the scale response from Iran. And yes, there's been condemnation, but there doesn't seem to be any expectation that Iran should be required to sort of hold back from preventing uh, you know, World War Three erupting in the Middle East, but always responsibility on Israel when, of course, there's not a chance in hell that Britain, America, France, or any other Western country would say, oh, you just launched 300 drone and missile attacks on us. That's fine. I don't want to start a war. I won't do anything. We would never hold ourselves to the same standard. That's right. I mean, the civilian point, I think, is an important one, because aside from the fact that Israel does not intentionally target civilians because it's a democracy with irresponsible armed forces or an imperfect one in some ways, also, the Iranian civilians are really Israel's best asset because the majority of everyday Iranians loathe the regime, which oppresses them and keeps them under its heel, um, you know, with its secret police, with its uh, ridiculous and, and absurd and draconian laws against the hijab and, 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 and public self-expression and so forth. And most Iranians actually are friends of Israel and support Israel. We see whenever there's an Israeli strike, we see celebrations, muted celebrations, but celebrations nonetheless uh, inside Iran. And so for Israel to attack Iran, Iranian civilians would be to attack their own yeah. allies. And one of the reasons that Israeli intelligence operations are so successful in Iran is because they have friends in the Iranian public that help them. Yes. So that would be uh, that would be a mistake. But I think that you're right. I mean, you know, the, 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 the international community emphasizing in public that the Israelis should show restraint is only telegraphing to the Iranians that, look, we've got your back. We've yeah. got your back. We're going to hold back the, the Israelis. Although, although I have to say, I was heartened and not a little surprised to see the, the, the level of Western support, including actual military support, RAF jets and American jets shooting down uh, some of those drones and missiles uh, over the weekend, because I think the, the, the West has been incredibly lily-livered uh, in terms of their support for Israel in this. And again, you know, let's all stop the pretense that this attack that by Israel on the Damascus compound was completely and utterly out of the blue and came from nowhere at all. Oh, I, I, last time I looked, Iran uh, openly stated by Ameri the, the, the same government saying that Israel shouldn't respond. Uh, they've been saying, you know, Iran, Iranian funded proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas, Houthi rebels have been attacking Israel, indeed, attacking Western shipping, funded by uh, Iran. I mean, you know, it's, it's, an absolute, it's an absolute nonsense, isn't it? Uh, what do you make of sanctions, though? Because one of the things the Western governments are looking at now, we've got the you know, G7 meeting uh, on, on the island of Capri uh, later today as well, where, you know, there's, there's going to actually be, you know, talk about more sanctions on Iran in terms of selling oil and the like. Um, is that likely to work, given the sort of, let's face it, the axis of evil that is going along in, in, in the world with Russia, Iran... Um, China and, and other countries that are just fighting against Western values uh, and democracy. Is there any chance that sanctions could seriously damage and undermine the Iranian, Iranian regime? Well, I have two thoughts on that. The first is that the Americans in particular have been failing to enforce their own existing sanctions, willfully evading their own sanctions legislation in order to give millions of dollars to the Iranians. In the run-up to October the 7th, America released $16 billion in frozen sanctions money to the Iranians as a sweetener to try to appease them so that they wouldn't launch any attacks and that it would come to the negotiating table and come to a nuclear agreement. And even since October the 7th, the, the Americans have released $10 billion to the Iranians. And that's despite their own sanctions. They've been also turning a blind eye to sector oil sanctions, allowing Iran to hit 2 million barrels a day in sales to China without the Americans raising any objections at all and other ways. And so you know, enforcing the existing sanctions would be a good start. But I think overall, uh, in terms of the sanctions that Rishi Sunak has been proposing, uh, rather than banning the Iranian terror regime in Britain, uh, trying to stop a fanatic with sanctions is a bit like trying to stop a knife man with a fine. If somebody's coming to stab you to death, saying that you're going to fine him isn't really going to help. We're dealing with a regime that is powered by a fanatical ideology that is lusting after a third world war in order to trigger the apocalypse. It believes in a prophecy of this messianic figure called, called the Mahdi coming out of invisibility in an apocalyptic scenario and leading the Islamic world to victory over the whole world, heralding a kind of end times. That's what it believes and that's what it wants. Stopping there with sanctions ain't going to work.
Uh, really good to talk to you. Jake wallace Simons. thank you very much indeed, uh, editor of the Jewish Chronicle. Let's bring in Benedict Spence. Now, you write a lot extensively uh, in, in, in the, about the Middle East and, and other world affairs. And it is one of the things that strikes me, which just Jake was touching on there at the end. So many in the West, particularly sort of the liberal left, sort of, oh, let's mm. be nice to everyone, multicultural, things like that. Don't, they just don't really get it. They mm. don't really get the existential threat that Islamist extremism in the form of Hamas, mm. of Hezbollah, of, of the Iranian, you know, uh, National Guard, you know, Revolution National Guard. They do not get the threat that this poses to mm. not just Israel, but to the West, to democracy, to, to our values, mm. uh, to, to everything we stand for in this, in, supposedly in the West. Oh, not even just that. It's also you know the stability of an entire region. If it was up to them, and on many occasions they have succeeded, they would destabilize the other countries in that region as well. Yeah. And you only need to see what happened uh, with the the invasion of Ukraine, by the way, by Russia, to see actually that wars increasingly have impacts beyond their borders. So even if you were to sort of sit here and say, okay, hypothetically they might want to you know declare a war on Britain or something, but that's a long way away. It's not. They can bring the suffering to you by all sorts of different ways. Yeah. We've seen that with the Houthi attacks on shipping. Uh, uh, in the Red Sea, that's you know led to massive sort of knock-on effects on supply chains, and is going to affect inflation later on this year. That's going to come, and people are going to feel that. And again, it's one of those things where you can't just sort of sit back and go, "It's someone else's problem." Not someone yet. else has to it's deal with it. There. It is very much our problem, and it will continue to be so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Do you'd love to hear your thoughts on that as well to get in touch on everything we're talking about, smoking ban vote, and and obviously asking you specifically about the uh, world's, well, the world's, probably world's, Britain's stick to his head teacher. Anyway, Catherine Burble Singh, she won that high cult battle yesterday after a Muslim people challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals. By the way, all funded by legal aid. A lot of you up in arms about that, quite rightly. I want to know your reaction. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. You can text 8722. You can also get in touch at, on X at Talk TV. Uh, let's get to some of your messages. As Sean says, um, is Catherine Bebel Singh banning Christian prayers too or just Muslim prayers? Yep, all prayers. But the Christian kids weren't uh, planning to, uh, weren't actually doing prayer rituals in the playground. Ronnie says, bring back proper discipline to our schools. They're much too soft nowadays and teachers have to bear the brunt of the toxic behaviour of this out of control society. Uh, Debbie says, I'm absolutely furious that legal aid was given to the mother and not the child uh, to bring the case against the school. There are people in serious situations who are not offered that money. I'm seeing red that my money was used for that case. John says, I thought people with a bit of common sense were a thing of the past, but I'm glad there are some of us left. Well done think, to the judge and to the to uh, the head teacher as well. Let's uh, get to some of your calls as well. Hussein is in Warwickshire. Good morning to you, Hussein. Hi. Um, can I say sal salam alaikum to you, Julia? Lovely watching your show. Well, thank you very interesting, much. Interesting conversation uh, a lot of people are having at the moment. Wanted to share my thoughts. I think the judge needs to go back to school because the school itself, uh, my understanding, is also breaking the law. They're meant to uh, provide an act of worship for the pupils at the school every day. So there seems to me uh, to me, a bit of hypocrisy to see that. Like they're saying it's a secular school when it's not. It does have, by law, a requirement. Uh, yeah, my, 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 I went to a secular comp, but again, I, we were discussing on the show a bit earlier, there is this requirement, but that's different. That's like an assembly where you mention, you know, there, there is but a sort of mention? joint act. Yeah, but you that's... mentioned the Lord. You mentioned the Lord, obviously, which yeah. is obviously something which is spiritual. Yeah, so, well, uh, that's a different. That's that's different from different. individual pupils different. choosing to have a particular prayer act. Do you it's have a, do, you, do you agree it, or disagree with the court I, judgment? I, 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 I disagree with the narrative you're saying it's a sex of school when at the same time it has a spiritual uh, dimension to it with regards to the act of worship. Which there just saying, has to be a daily... No, but again, I went to the exact, exactly the same sort of school. No, it, it, we didn't pray at yes, my school. We didn't. They, they just had to mention God at some point in assembly once again. Which ago. is an act of worship, obviously. It's a spiritual it's dimension. Not, it's not an act of worship. It's just it's the children should be made aware. Well, you mentioned That's the a Lord. legal requirement. What is the Lord? That's what is different. The Lord? Okay. But that's different. I, I, there's no reason it's to believe... It's not different. It's Hussain, school. Hussain, Hussain there's no the reason law. to believe that the school is breaking the law and not doing that. They'll be obeying the law. There, I'm there talking about this... clarification. You haven't really got, um, with respect, the head to answer that question. If the recall... Of I've spoken to Catherine Burbel Singh about this worship. before. If she is, she said she has uh, basically an assembly where she mentions the law to obviously whether um, during the assemblies they mention the law. For me, that that that's a religious act. Now going back to regarding this going to court, yeah. it shouldn't have really gone to court because um, parents and teachers really should have gone round the table. They should have had a conversation to say, look. This is something which is happening at break time, and obviously it's a break from the school day, 
a break from the curriculum. And in that break mm-hmm. time, you have all kinds of activities. Children like ourselves, we could play cricket, play football, maybe go to the library. So this is a space that the pupils are using to reflect, to contemplate, you know, a, a, like a, an act of mindfulness. So I don't understand why it had to why be back. Back. Well, Catherine Burble singh was very clear. We interviewed her about this before, and in the court case, she was very clear, and in her statement yesterday, that actually what was happening was children, it grew to be about 30 children who were praying the day. They were intimidating other children during Ramadan. They should join. Children were intimidated to leave the choir because it was considered to be uh, inappropriate to be uh, singing uh, during uh, certain religious festivals. We had, uh, and they said, children, you know, children were being bullied and, and, and difference was being focused on as opposed to the school community. That was why she banned it. There isn't a room in the school where children can go and do that because, and the court accepted that because it's such a small building. And in the playground, it was making a statement that was dividing pupils rather than uniting them. She has a right as a school head to say, no, I'm not having it. Schools work in partnership with uh, the communities, the mosques, the temples, the churches. You know, everybody around schools don't work in isolation with the pupils. You know, they're basically... uh, surrounded by demographics and communities and families so they work together with parents no, but she, well, with but, no, but at the end of the oh, day the head teacher can gets the final something? say Hussein can I, can I say something yeah. can I actually say something you know the, the point you made I agree with you nobody should be intimidated to do any but act they were. of worship but, but similarly Nobody should be compelled not to do an act of worship in a time which is your own time. But it's not. No, it's do not your own time. You're at school, and the school rules still apply. I mean, it's, if you, the parents could have sent their kid to a faith school, they chose not to. They're apparently they're planning to send a younger sibling to that school. So clearly, they want to send the kid to that school. If you go to that school, you sign up to the rules, and the rules are no ritual, you know, worship rituals. I don't understand why people think this is complicated. Don't like it? Don't go to the school. Hussein, thank you for calling. I have to hurry you on simply because we've got to go to a break. This is. Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Quite right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, there was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t- when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong.
Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good morning to you. This is Talk TV with me, Julia Hartley. But Benedict Spence is still with us. Um, actually, we've just been taking a call and reading out messages about the Catherine Burble seeing the Michaela Community School winning that High Court uh, judgment yesterday. Uh, hails a victory for common sense by, well, <laughs> anyone with common sense after a Muslim pupil uh, asked to have a prayer ban overturned so uh, they could uh, actually pray uh, a Muslim uh, prayer ritual in the middle of the playground along with other children in the middle of the day. Well, let's talk about this right now with uh, Akil Ahmed, who is the former head of religion at the BBC. Uh, good morning to you. Morning. Good morning. Thanks. Uh, what do you make of this uh, High Court decision? I think it was a victory for common sense and head teachers getting the final say. What do you say? Well, I think the, the point that you made is quite right, which is obviously people that there's a there was a, um, a policy of secularism of, in the school and people signed up to that. So when they went to that school, there's an understanding of what 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 that school entails and actually what their policies are. So I think it in this particular instance, I think, you know, you, it's very difficult for it to be anything, any, anything else. Although I suppose the judgment also talked about that, but that this would be discriminatory to the Muslim pupils as well. So what I think what this has done is actually, you're right, yeah, yeah you could you could argue in from one particular constituency, it's a kind of like a victory for common sense. I think it's, it's a shame that these things get so far down the line. I mean, how much of a yeah. compromise could have been made at some point? And I think there are bigger questions, there are bigger conversations about this beyond this one particular school, because I think this is quite a specific school of a specific headmistress, which is doing really well and has a particular kind of ethos. Mm. And I think you can't apply this to all of the well, schools I wish, as well. I wish we could, because I wish all schools had the same ethos and did as well by the children, particularly children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm always fascinated by people who think there's a compromise in this. Like people who want to let's have a compromise on, on you know, on the death penalty. Let's have a compromise on abortion. Let's have a compromise on whether or not a kid can or cannot uh, pray in the middle of the school playground in the middle of the school day. You either can or you can't. Who gets to have the say? Is it the head teacher or is it the pupil? It's just a no-brainer for me. What is the compromise? No, I think the, the, the head, the headmaster, whatever, they, they have to have that. The, the, the board of governors, the school, the LEA, or whatever, depending on how the particular school is is structured, has to have. Yeah. You have to have guidelines. So, what's the you compromise? You say them. people could have got around the table, and a well, previous caller said, "What is the compromise?" Well, uh, this is just a um, just as a wider point. The compromise could be if, depending on what the numbers were, and if you're talking, about, remember, initially this this kicked off because you had people praying in the in the. In, in the playground, in the winter, on their blazers. Mm. It was probably a bit of a bad look. And at that time, a conversation then about maybe allocating a room at lunch. There wasn't a room. Is, no, that's, that was one of the but, key points they made. We don't have a room. That the school is exactly. absolutely tiny. They yeah. don't have the facilities. There wasn't That's why I'm saying this break. particular school, and I know the location example. of that school as well. I think this particular school isn't the perfect yeah. example because of all of the things around it. Yeah. But as a general point, we have to have... I mean, look, there's a bigger point here, which is... As Catherine says in her in, a, in the statement, fifty percent of this popu of this school population is Muslim. Yeah, and 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 quite and and it's and growing. And it's growing. But this is the so thing. What... Why did why did pupils who've been at that school for a number of years and all the people has been open not feel the need to pray? Suddenly they felt the need to pray, and suddenly this was a battle again. A lot of people will suspect, like a lot yeah. of uh, what's going on at the moment, it's sort of we're talking about a sort of a political ideology and a sort of a sort of a standing up you know, an assertion as opposed to you know, having well, having one's religion. Now, I would feel the same way, whether it was Catholic kids or Jewish kids or Muslim kids, Sikh kids. I, you know, if you've gone to a secular school, we have, in my view, far too many faith schools. I would have zero faith schools in this country. I don't, I'm with France. I don't think that you're talking to the converted and on faith that one. should yeah. have anything to do. You want to yeah. go to church, want to go to synagogue, want to go to mosque, that's great. Schools should be about bringing children together, which is what Makeda School is all about, not focusing on the divide. You're not a Muslim kid. You're not a Catholic kid. You're all just pupils at this school. And it seems to me that, you know, that, that case undermined it. What do you think about the legal aid? I mean, should a mum have had legal aid for that case? I, I don't know enough about whether or not the legal aid was... I don't know. The, the rules and regulations on legal aid now, I've got to be honest with you, because from friends who are actually lawyers, it's all over yeah. the place, and it's not what it was before. So I don't have an opinion on that. It does seem a bit strange, but that's not for me to comment on. I think the bigger comment, the bigger thing we need to address is 
like I said, this is a specific school. What happens though when you've got people, and you know, not every single person. I think we've got to be careful as well. It was a young schoolgirl who had this idea, and she wanted to complain. If if an individual wants to do something, they have to be allowed to do it, whether it's right or wrong. To and complain. actually, they've been, and actually, the law was found against her. So the fact of the matter is, she had to go through the process. But there she is a bigger issue here, which which will have to. Well, no, but what I meant was she went through the process yeah. and, and, we, and actually yeah, But we paid for it. That's what bothers a lot of my, my audience. Akhil Ahmed, really appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Hall, former head of religion at the BBC. Quick word from Benedict Spence. I think actually that last point is rather rather good, actually, because children need to learn that you don't just get your way all the time. So actually, yeah. yes, whilst the legal aid bill, ridiculous, shouldn't have gone this far, actually, I don't think there's anything wrong with trying and complaining and trying to change things. But actually getting the answer that is no, you don't just get yeah. to push your way. I think that's an important lesson that children do need well, to learn could have just accepted sooner when the head if teacher not, said it. If they're not going to accept it, they need to be told no via several different yeah, routes. Maybe I know it's parents depressing. should start saying no to their kids. I know! Mind-blowing idea! Might catch on again one day. 11.56 is the time. Back in a few moments, this is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to it was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Woke that was, we've got Pete Barnes, we've got Lois Perry, and we've got the author of Gender Madness, all in London, and we've got someone I don't like. <laughs> Your 
Good afternoon and welcome back to the show. I'm Julia Hartley Brew. You're with Talk TV. We're on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. I'm with you live from 10 until 1. Where have you been the last couple of hours? Uh, coming up in this hour, Nigel Farage has hit out at what he called an updated form of Soviet communism. This after the socialist mayor of Brussels tried to shut down the National Conservatism Conference where he was speaking yesterday. I'll be talking to another of the speakers in just a few moments' time. We'll also bring you all the highlights from Prime Minister's questions, always on the assumption that there are some highlights and the Duchess of Sussex Meghan Markle has unveiled the first product of her new lifestyle brand and guess what it's strawberry jam how interesting and exciting Meghan first then let's get the latest news headlines with Tibia Coley this is talk tv news Good afternoon. The Foreign Secretary is in Israel to discuss its response to Iran's weekend drone and missile strikes. Lord Cameron has joined calls by the US and the EU to place restrictions on Iran, but is urging Israel not to retaliate with force. Former Israeli Justice Minister Dr Yossi Belin told Talk TV the free world must unite against Iran. I uh, don't see any reason to continue this uh, vicious uh, circle uh, with Iran, but it is an opportunity to think about what is happening with Iran. Uh, it's a wrong country and should be uh, related to uh, in that way. The Prime Minister's plan to phase out smoking is one step closer to coming into law. Despite some opposition, the proposals to ban smoking among youngsters passed its first hurdle in the Commons last night. Rishi Sunak wants to raise the legal age each year in a bid to phase out the habit, as well as restrict the sales of vapes. On the street, there's been mixed reaction. Yeah, it's good because kids can't smoke then, can they? But people do get people to go to the shop, don't they, to buy them, so... It's not really going to stop anyone, is it? And I personally think cigarettes can't be banned. People will go mad. I think it does set a good example. I think it's good. It prevents a lot of younger people from smoking in the future. Inflation has fallen to its lowest level in two and a half years as cost of living pressures continue to ease. Inflation fell from 3.4 to 3.2 percent in March, meaning what we pay for goods and services is rising at a slower rate. The Office for National Statistics says food prices was one of the major contributing factors. Post Office boss Nick Reed has been cleared of bullying claims. In a statement, the Post Office said Mr Reed has been exonerated of all misconduct allegations following an independent review and would continue to lead the organisation. Concerns over the chief executive's behaviour were made public after former chairman Henry Staunton raised them to a select committee looking at the Horizon IT scandal. Labour says Angela Rayner is happy to provide police with whatever information they need as she continues to be investigated. The Times are reporting officers are examining multiple allegations, including tax matters, and if Miss Rayner gave false information to the Electoral Register. Labour Shadow Education Minister Catherine McKinnell says the Labour deputy leader is fully cooperating with the authorities. She has said very clearly she is happy to provide all of that information to the relevant authorities, HMRC, to the police. In fact, she welcomes it because she wants to draw a line under this situation. And Adidas says it's recovered from its sales decline after cutting ties with Kanye West. The sportswear giant ditched the rapper at the end of 2022 after he made anti-Semitic comments on social media. That led to its first losses in three decades, but the company says its profits could reach nearly £600 million this year. That's the latest weather time now with Nazni Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's still looking rather blustery out there for today and there will be some showers, particularly across eastern areas of the UK. As we see an area of low pressure slide its way southwards along the east coast, bringing some heavy and thundery showers. There's also an area of cloud and rain moving its way southwards from Northern Ireland, the Republic, to the far west of Wales and southwest England by the end of this afternoon. Everywhere else, there'll be some bright or sunny spells, but there's also going to be quite a few showers, as I mentioned, especially across central and eastern areas of the UK, some of which will be heavy and thundery with 
with the risk of hail. And it's feeling cool with the northerly winds and the briskness of those winds as well. Temperatures only up to around 10 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, the showers will fade away southwards, as will the rain across the southwest, and it will be largely dry and clear. Winds will become lighter as well, so it's going to be quite a chilly night. And in rural spots, there could be frosty conditions. By dawn, there will be cloud and rain from the next low moving to the northwest of the UK. And that will continue to move its way southwards across Scotland and Northern Ireland through tomorrow morning. And then later, towards the north of England and Wales, there will be cloudier skies and patchy rain. Further south, though, it looks mostly fine and bright and feeling milder with the lighter winds in the sunshine. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Good afternoon and welcome back to Talk TV with me, Julia hartley -Brewer. Thank you very much indeed for your company. We're on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And lots more to talk about uh, in this hour. Still with me in the studio is Benedict Spence. Uh, thank you once again very much for joining us. Now, we've always introduced you as Conservative commentator, Benedict Spence. I don't know if that... It's a small C rather than a big it's C. It's because I'm wearing a blue suit and I went to public school. Uh, yes, yeah. It so seems likely. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, odds are. Although <laughs> I'm actually, too polite to push Actually, back. I would say far left, far more likely to go to public school. Oh, Far more like all the poshers. I worked at the Guardian. Oh, I, I didn't know. go to. Uh, this is the weirdest school. thing. I worked at the Guardian. <laughs> One year, three months, and two days. Not that I was counting every single day of horror, um, but I, I've never come across more kids who've gone to private school than anywhere I've ever worked. But I didn't go to Winchester or Harrow, Julia. I went to I went to a regional <laughs> No one knows school. what you're talking about. <laughs> anyway, right. But anyway, you, we introduced, I'm starting with, we introduced you, you know, as a Conservative commentator, and mm. yet not invited to the Conservatism Conference. Mm. I hate this one. National Conservatism Conference that uh, was held in Brussels. Now, probably a good thing because um, it, it turns out it was a bit of a, a bit of a fiasco yesterday, but I have to say, did wonders for publicity for a conference, which otherwise we would have probably vaguely registered if one had done a big speech. Mm. Um, now, Nigel Farage was uh, on stage speaking at the moment when the socialist mayor of Brussels, Tim Pot nobody of a Tim Pot town in a Tim Pot country, just saying, call it as it is, decided he wanted to close down this conference, bearing in mind this was the third venue that the conference had actually had to find to actually uh, be able to actually host uh, the conference. And uh, that conference, uh, Nigel Farage speaking, and then you've got a situation where three police officers turn up and say, you've got to close it down. Because apparently there might be violence outside. There wasn't any violence outside. There were about five protesters. There was no violence. And anyway, why would that mean you had to throw, close a conference down? But they ended up putting a ring of steel of armed police officers surrounding the venue. No one in, no one out. No one in, including the catering. And some speakers couldn't get in. However, the idea was that this was some sort of group of hard right, far right speakers that were provoking this reaction. We actually was... I'm with the people who are on the on the list to speak. You know, Nigel Farage, as I say, the, the Brexit uh, Party president. Um, uh, Suella Bravman, our former Home Secretary, um, later to speak this week. Liz Truss, our former Prime Minister. Um, Mar Miriam Cates, uh, a prominent uh, Conservative MP, and also the democratically elected leader of uh, Hungary in Viktor Orban. Um, Benedict, I mean, it is absolutely extraordinary that they thought it was acceptable to close this conference down. Numerous different attempts. I just think, you know, the, the claims that there could be violence. You know, the, those famously pugnacious Walloons and Flemish people, you know, always sort of breaking into riots at the possibility of somebody with different politics to them. Honestly, I think that this is a sort of a standard response uh, from uh, sort of the, the politics as usual of Europe as economic growth slides as social problems rise actually what you won't see is new and interesting ideas of how to solve issues there will be the crackdown on anybody who differentiates no you yeah. can't have a different line because that's an extreme line and that's what yeah. the real problem is not the problems that are currently Again, facing nothing us. i mean these these are mainstream politicians mm. uh, nigel farage pointed out when he called this a uh, an updated form of soviet communism mm. that, that actually you know a lot of leaders of political parties in european nations which are facing uh, European elections in June mm. um, are likely to win those elections and yet being told to be shut down. Well, mm. let's talk to somebody now who was also at the conference as a speaker, who is Ralph Schulhammer. You know him well here on Talk TV. He's a political theorist and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, based at Vienna University. Uh, good afternoon to you, Ralph. To see you, Julia. I Thanks. was actually hoping you would uh, introduce me as a far-right firebrand. Far-right uh, firebrand. Well, we're all far-right now, apparently. <laughs> I mean, if you're not if you're not basically if you're not if you're not Owen Jones, you're all far right now. Now you've been you've been at this conference as well. Have you already spoken, or are you due to speak? 
I spoke yesterday. Mm -hmm. So uh, kudos to the organizers. I think they really had to carry quite the burden that uh, ultimately they were capable of going through with the event. But uh, just to add on to your conversation that you had before, right? I think we have to realize that it's the obligation of the state to protect those who want to speak and not to protect those who want to prevent others yes. from speaking. But this is the direction in which we are going. And just as a real quick point also for your viewers, this is the direction in which all these ideas of hate speech laws like in Scotland or uh, uh, democracy enhancement laws in Germany. So they have all these fancy names uh, with anti-disinformation campaigns or anti-disinformation rules for Facebook for, for, for all the, the social media platforms. This is the direction in which they want to go. There is a part of the population all over the West right that those who are in power want to exclude from the public debate so this yeah. yesterday was an isolated incident if you want but you could also say it was a dry run for the things they plan in the years to come because i think all over europe all over the united states there is a sense of trepidation and fear within the leading elites in the media in politics and anywhere else that there is a, at least at the voting booth an uprising of the people afoot and now they say if we can just undermine their way to communicate if we can kind of get them shut out from the public debates then maybe we can also defeat them in elections but yeah. these are then of course not really true and fair elections anymore no i mean indeed and it is fascinating i mean people might liken this to, to the, what people call and donald trump certainly calls a witch hunt, witch hunt against him if he's so awful defeat him at the the ballot box many people would say but this is the fascinating thing i it is never a occurred to me and I'm sure never occurred to you that I need to have people who disagree with me who are pushing forward other ideas whether they are just simply you know I don't know middle of the road ideas you know we talk about the smoking ban uh, today or or, or or discipline in schools or or an economic policy or something horrific and far right and and, and racist and something you and I would never agree with. um I would never feel the need to have that shut down because I know that I can argue and debate that and I can defeat those bad ideas with my good ideas and let people make the choice. And we saw that with it's famously Nick Griffin, the leader of the BNP, uh, it, it, genuinely a far right party um, in, in this country, being invited on Question Time. Big hoo-ha, like, oh, you shouldn't like these people a platform. And I'd always argued they should be given a platform. And I worked in a local paper in East End of London when the BNP had their first elected council. I always said, no, give them a platform because you expose them to daylight and and uh, and and people will be able to hear what they actually say hear their arguments and what a surprise support for that party collapsed afterwards as it always does when these people come to light um tell me the sort of um tell me the sort of thing that people were saying on stage at the conference on i say it's third venue as each one was basically talked out of hosting this event what was what were, you know what did you say what did you know uh, Miriam Cates or, or, or no, sorry, Suella Brabham, I have to say, what did Nigel Farage have to say that was so awful and dangerous that it needed to be shut down? I think it was usually what I would consider a mainstream position. Some of them I agree with, some of them uh, I might disagree with, but the main topic, of course, was uh, migration, right? Another topic was whether or not Europe and the European Union are the same thing. And I think there's growing agreement, at least on the political right, that you can love Europe, but you can reject the European Union. Um, there was the matter of energy, right? As we always talk about, there was the matter of farming and there was kind of the general matter of if the direction in which Europe, including the United Kingdom, if I may, is going at the moment. And it's not a good direction. I mean, we see this if you look at uh, the polls, what's going to happen in the elections in Britain. Most people in Britain are not happy with the political system. Yeah. Most Europeans are not happy with the political system. In an ironic way, I think the general population of continental Europe and the United Kingdom have never been as unified as now in their dissatisfaction faction with the powers that are and the frustrating thing is there was a lot of comparison oh this is like in the soviet union like this is like in fascism but it's more insidious because in fascism and soviet in the soviet union you knew you were living under a totalitarian regime but what happened yesterday in belgium was they are not saying we shutting you down we ban you from speaking right they say well we would allow you to speak but it's really a hassle with public order yeah. and you can go to the courts and you can find another venue so they don't just say you can't do it they just create conditions where they make more and more and more obstacles in the hopes of those who want to speak to throw in the towel and say is it all worth it and yeah. this is i think what people must understand that that the kind of tyranny developing in the west is a capricious one right it, it's one that is not coming with you know uh, brown shirts and and you know jack boots it's coming in in a way yeah. that it makes your life more miserable yeah. uh, what i like to say they don't go for the body they go straight for the soul and i think this is a major issue yeah absolutely and look, we've seen this in uh, in british universities and i'm sure we've seen it i mean certainly in american universities so shutting down i mean really prominent you know thoughtful speakers to, about talking 
talking about you know trans ideology and the impact on women uh, talking about why critical race theory is actually you know it's not anti-racism it's just another form of racism people talking about things people go no no there might be trouble we're not allowing this event to go ahead or some people in the room might not like what you say it might be triggered and might not be able to cope with it. i mean these are absurd ideas that um i mean certainly you know when i was younger at university this, no one would ever thought of this but we see this with our media as well the attempts to shut down um you know uh, people who who say things that people don't like whether it's nigel farage or gb news or or me or or, or whether it's uh, uh you know a, attempts to sort of just you know i suppose censor what could be heard censor who the guests are on tv there was a whole campaign to stop me being invited on bbc shows because people didn't like what i had to say i mean like you're not supposed to like what every guest has to say. It's, I mean, it would never, ever occur to me to say someone I disagreed with, even if I thought they were genuinely a bad person, that they should be censored from speaking. And yet this is common, not just on the far left, but on the moderate left, and even, I would say, among centre-right as well. This sort of, you know, you're far right, I'm far right, we're all, we're all terrible, heinous people for saying stuff which, as you and I know, is actually mainstream opinion. Right. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And what you said is very, very important. It is no longer an interest in finding the better solution. So if you want to use the high mighty term of finding truth, the question is always, how do you make someone feel? And then, yeah. of course, all bets are off. Because if I say, or you might say, Ralph, you're a bold guy. <laughs> and maybe that makes me feel bad. So I say, well, Julia should be banished from speaking because she's insulting me. Right? It doesn't even matter that what you say is correct. What matters is that it might hurt my feelings. And you I could, you could identify, you could identify as a man with with a full head of hair if you wanted. Apparently, that's what we're allowed to do now. Identify as what we why, want. Why are you assuming? Why are you assuming that I identify as a man? That is very presumptuous <laughs> of you. <laughs> but this, but this thing, this is the nonsense that we've got into, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, this is there, there was always a certain. I always say this is particularly true for the British. There's always a certain tolerance for the eccentric, but we always knew that it was eccentric and therefore yes. limited to the fringes of society. But now we have kind of the fringes and the eccentricities kind of taking over the center. And now in many ways, I would also argue, particularly about the younger generation, many want to be identified as eccentric. I think, for example, oh, yeah. what we talked also at the conference, what you see happening is that I think it was 25% of, of Gen Zers or under 25 year olds identify as anything but a heterosexual. No, that's ridiculous. We know that's a social contagion. That's a, that's a fashion thing. You want to be seen as special. Uh, and there, of course, you know, we kind of lose a little bit grip of reality because yeah. what's real is not as important as, you know, how you feel about things or how you can present yeah. yourself. And Absolutely. I think that's, that's, that's not good. Absolutely. I mean, it's fascinating. What do you think the reaction should be to this? I mean, you know, you know, when it comes to this conference, the, the, the conference is supposed to go on for a few more days. And they're looking for another venue uh, and carrying on. That we need to stand firm on these issues and, and, and make sure that, that these sort of events can go ahead and that people get to talk and get to meet. And we need to make sure that even when it is someone who is saying something that we really disagree with and we really disapprove of even, that we should stand firm. And I thought, think back to, you know, gosh, way back when we're talking decades ago when the, uh, you know, the, the uh, ACLU in America, the Association of Civil Liberties, um, you know, um, no, no, advanced, advanced the colored people in civil liberties, generally, they, they actually campaigned, um, did they not, was it, was it them, but campaigned for, to allow a Nazi rally to go through a Jewish area because they said they still had the freedom of speech and actually, when you when you try and shut down events and shut down freedom of speech, you know it's actually it tends to be minorities that that tend to actually end up being the the bigger victims in the long run. It's in all of our interest to protect everybody's freedom of speech. Well, yeah, and as you as mentioned out, and I think let's have the debate. What is so unnerving very often, and I'm sure this happens to you as well, is it is very hard to find people. And that is also, by the way, partially true on the right. So I'm not just accusing the left of this, is to have a debate, to go on shows like yours or somebody else and say, OK, let's hash out the argument. Yeah. Uh, it might get a little bit heated. I mean, you notice yourself, like you have been part of this very often. It gets a little heated, but at least then you have both sides of the argument and the people are smart enough to decide. But this idea too, I don't even want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. I think that's, a, that's it's also, by the way, a boring trend. Yeah. It, it's kind of oh, people yeah. want public and but, they can handle it but it's not just i don't want to hear it i don't want anyone else to hear it part of that to me is not right. just about you know people being sort of authoritarian they're also they're also contemptuous of voters 
go back to Brexit. People didn't know what they were voting for. They were conned by the Russian bots, by lies on the side of a bus. Um, by the way, um, NHS gets more than £350 million pounds extra a week now, so not a lie. Um, and anyway, it wasn't a promise. It was, we could. Um, but um, they, they were conned by Donald Trump. Uh, they, they were conned. Everyone's been conned all along. Whenever people, you know, conned by Boris Johnson, whenever people vote for the so-called populist option, I've never understood why that's considered an insult, something being popular, appealing to what people actually want. Then they've just been called. This is the general view that we, the voters, we're just a bit too stupid, we're a bit too gullible, and let's face it, a bit too nasty and bigoted and racist as well. Don't forget that. Um, and that's why we will vote for horrible people if we're allowed to hear what they have to say. People, supposedly Democrats, like a mayor of Brussels, actually contemptuous of democracy. I think that's that's to be very clear because this is the new talking uh, line on the left whenever they talk about defending democracy be aware of what they mean they mean defending democracy from the likes of you and me and yeah. and people who speak similarly like, like we do that's what they mean because you you hit the nail on the head ultimately what they think is that democracy is too precious to leave it to the will of the voters so in order to defend <laughs> democracy we have to, to abolish democracy and as i said you might be on the, not you, but somebody might be on the political left and say, oh, those national conservatives, uh, why should they speak? But the thing is, you say that now, but tomorrow it might be your speech that's going to be banned. So I think this is a dangerous development. And as I always say, the left does one thing very cleverly, by the way, and this is something where they have to pick up. They use terms that make it hard to disagree, right? For example, they talk about the European Court of Human Rights. It has human rights in its title. How can it be anybody against this? Yeah. They say they're anti-fascist. Well, how can it be against anti-fascist? That would make you a fascist. So they're really good good in using those terms. So I think it's important also for us to kind of reclaim that territory, to kind of reclaim the, the verbiage that is being used, because they do this better than we do. Absolutely. Um, great to talk to you, Rolf Schoenheimer. Thank you very much indeed. Political theorist and economist, Webster University in Vienna, uh, but speaking at that Brussels conference yesterday. Uh, Benedict Spence is still with me. Um, I'm, just, I'm gutted I wasn't invited to this conference, frankly. I don't know, may maybe, I'm, maybe I'm too left-wing. I don't know. But it, it is have had a bit of a tear-up in Europe, bit of a, bit like, of a like English Europe. people you yeah. know, once did. It would have been a very exciting well, event. I, I, I understand that there is a promise <laughs> of, a, of, a, of a big night out on, I think it was it Friday night, I think this week, the end of the conference. I think it's the end of the conference. Big night out in Brussels. Uh, big night out in Brussels. Well, <laughs> Being, being led by being led by Nigel Farage because of course he, he knows, knows. <laughs> he knows where all the bars and restaurants. Although as he pointed out, he's actually banned mm. from a lot of them because he led that uh, that uh, campaign to get us out of Europe. The biggest drinking politician in Britain, and they banned him from pubs. I mean, these these people, people are crazy. How would you leave them with your economic policy? That's a that's a dreadful <laughs> idea. That's well, very good point. Who but it's really as well. Shalhammer says so. People think, oh well, it's happening to them. Mm, mm. Did it? It's like it's like when we had the th again. I don't bring him up too much. I shouldn't talk about him. He's just a waste of space. But Owen Jones. Uh, that laughing people are openly laughing about mm. you know people showing milkshakes in the face of people yeah. like Nigel Farage because it was okay when it was happening to them oh mm. but someone shouts at one of the people on your side oh then you're all upset about it we should always be horrified when anyone is shut down or intimidated mm. it's interesting uh, Mr Shulhammer was, was talking about uh, you know the idea of having to protect democracy from the people because Lord forbid they actually have a say and this is one of the things I think conservatives and perhaps they should be discussing this at this conference don't seem to get you don't have to allow uh, the illiberal to use your liberal mechanisms, your democratic mechanisms, to shut you down. There's nothing liberal about saying we can tolerate the voices of the authoritarians. Yeah. That's not, in fact, a conservative thing to do. Yeah. That's not a free-thinking thing to do. It is acceptable to say, actually, no, we vehemently oppose these people from actually yeah. seeking power and be a little bit more aggressive about it. But mm -hmm. specifically in the UK, when we're talking about woke ideas, you know, uh, Ralph, again, he, he mentioned the idea of the eccentric in, in Britain, yeah. how we were very tolerant of that, the eccentric. But, but we also, knew they were eccentric. We did, and we were Polite about it, and we were tolerant. We were indulgent up to a point. We weren't ridiculous, but we were polite about it. We didn't like. To we kick didn't up let too them make policy in the NHS or in schools. And this is what makes us in the UK particularly susceptible to these extreme ideas because we are tolerant of things that are a little bit nuts, but also we don't like to kick up a fuss. Yeah unduly and I think it has allowed us uh, it has allowed a lot of these ideas particularly coming from the United States a lot yeah. of you know, these progressive woke ideas yeah. to really bed in before people even are aware of what they are they don't exactly. have the mechanisms most, to most push people back. were unaware again like the trans ideology what it was doing and the mm. wokery and the critical race theory so until, you, until you're made by your HR department in your, your company mm. uh, to or you're, if you're working as a public servant local council whatever to mm. go on a course where basically you're told you're a white supremacist you're racist or if mm. you're black you're, you're a victim people didn't know you know 
didn't know this. No, we never had a debate about bringing this in. Yeah, if I could sum it up in a sentence, Britain is a victim of its own tolerance. It has been yes. far too tolerant. We, we of should be the intolerant of. Also, by the way, I hate it when people talk about progressive. These people yeah. are not. You know what I mean. Though. I know exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you very much, Dean. More from Benedict Spence. Twelve twenty-five is the time. Let's get back to lots of your messages coming in about Britain's strictest head teacher, Catherine Burble Singh. She won her High Court battle yesterday against a Muslim people who uh, went to court with legal aid, tens of thousands of pounds of your and my money, uh, and with her mum, because you know mums don't say no to their kids anymore. Uh, she had challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals. I want to know what your reaction is. You can give us a call oh three double four four double nine one thousand. You can text. Uh, 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Um, Colin has got in touch and says, oh, what a superb example of what a head teacher should be. I'm so pleased she won the court case. Why should one person have the right to challenge the running of the school? I don't suppose she might consider running for prime minister. She would be just what we need. I would love. I would love to vote. Catherine Burble Singh party. I will vote for that party. Ollie says, I was born and grew up in Brent. This, of course, is where the Michaela Community School is in northwest London. I can tell you there is no shortage of Islamic faith schools in Brent. If these people genuinely wanted to pray throughout the day, she could easily enrol at any one of those Islamic, Islamic schools. Doug says, far from strict, the woman just knows common sense. And Matt says, excellent news and a solid victory for common sense and British values. If these people don't like our way of life, then they're free to exercise their right of free movement and leave. I'm sick and tired of being dictated to on issues of respect when others show zero respect for the British way of life and culture. I mean, there's no reason to think this, uh, this family is, is not completely British, born, these children are born here. Uh, but the question is in terms of accepting the values of, of a country and I say the rules of the school. Um, let's go on the phone lines now. As I say, the number to call in 0344 499 1000. Barbara has called that number. She's in East Sussex. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Julia. Lovely okay. to speak to you. Love to speak to you. What Good do you afternoon. want to say? Well, I just want to say I agree with everything you have said. Oh, dear. About... <laughs> You're no, far I right. I agree. What a horrible person. Said... <laughs> <laughs> I'm a... Well, if, if I'm a horrible person, so are you then. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's just common sense, isn't it? Um, absolute common sense. Here, here's the thing. I mean, let me imagine. If, I don't know if you've got kids or you know, certainly when you were a kid, if if you didn't like a rule, or your kid didn't like a rule, and came to you and said, uh, "I'm going to take, I want to do a legal challenge against this rule," what would your reaction have been, or your mum's reaction? Well, I'd have said, "Don't be so stupid." <laughs> Shut you know, up. We go to your room. It. I just think that, quite honestly, these faith schools—it's a shame we've got them. But as you say, there's plenty of faith Islamic schools in Brent. Why don't they go there? Yeah, it does seem good. I mean, I, I genuinely—I I was so upset when I um, looked around at schools for my daughter ahead of when she was, you know, four, mm. four, or five years mm. old. That, I say all of the schools near me were faith schools. All of them. Um, we yeah. don't go. We don't go to church. And most of them, all but one, required us to go to church every th yeah. Sunday. And we would have had to have done it, you know, before she was even yeah. born to be considered you know legit and i'm just like well, i'm not prepared to do that no it's ridiculous i think you know and if these people i, I couldn't actually believe the amount of them uh, people at the school gates demonstrating yeah horrible yeah you know you're you're lucky to be able to be in a country that tolerates you being able to i don't think anyone should be demonstrating outside any school at all it's clearly intimidating we had we had teachers one teacher had a brick through their window for goodness sake absolutely awful if you don't like i have to say this i'm sorry but if you don't really like this country and you don't like the way we're running it which i can't say i do particularly at the moment but you know, you ha are free, as you say, to leave. Well, why, OK, if you're not happy, why don't you leave? I wish <laughs> I could. I'm too old now. <laughs> no, well, never, never job. But that's the thing. I don't, I don't really like the sort of free to leave. Although I, I know I've said it myself before. There is a moment where it's people, for people who've come to this country. So let's say this family, maybe it's the parents born in this country, um, um, the, the, the children, you know, certainly born in this country. Um, every right to be here. But again, it's about... It's about us all having shared values, isn't it? And that's the question. It's about, you know, when, when, when a particular set of values clashes with sort of the values of a school or the values of British society generally, then, I, I, I'm, again, I'm not a multiculturalist. I think we should accept that. I don't, I, I wouldn't, I'd feel the same way about Catholic kids or, or Sikh kids or Jewish kids or C of E kids insisting on praying in the middle of the playground. Absolutely. You're at school. You're there to learn, for goodness sake. Yeah. 
Absolutely. You know, it's not up to the children, I want to pray. You are there to learn. Yeah. Can I just say, do you think we should break this news to um, teachers in a lot of other schools who aren't delivering the sort of results that Catherine Burple Singh does for her kids? The thing I'm still amazed by is that the fact that the mother of this kid is going, wants to do another legal challenge, she said, on another issue. And she uh, she wants to uh, send her another si younger sibling uh, of the kid to the school. Amazing. Uh, great to talk to you, Barbara. Thank you very much indeed for calling in. It's 12.29. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Then we're going to be back with Peter Carwell, our chief political commentator, with the highlights, if there are any, of PMQs. That's up next. This is Talk TV. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good afternoon. This is Talk TV with me, Julia hartley Brew. Thank you very much indeed for joining me. We are on uh, TV, on radio, online, on your smart speaker. And joining us in the studio right now, along with Benedict Spence, who's been here throughout the show, uh, is our chief political commentator, Peter Carwell. Uh, good afternoon to Hi, you. Julia. Now, you're here to give us the highlights of PMQs. Usual first question. <laughs> we always ask it, because this is going to be a really short item sometimes. Were there any highlights? There actually were. It was peppy. It was actually a bit nasty. It was definitely worth watching. I love that you're smiling as yeah. you say that. Oh, I, I Yay! This is going <laughs> to be fun. I love we a bit of drama. Quite a lot about Angela Rayner, but there was a, a, an interesting... Keir Starmer had clearly thought in his first question he was going to get a nice dig in about Liz Truss's book and what she'd said and... Bring, I mean, even though Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, big rivals, he was going to tar Rishi Sunak with the brush of Liz Truss and everything that she had done and what a lot of people disagree with, some agree with, of course. But, I mean, it went horribly wrong for him if we take a look at the first uh, clip. Absolutely. Let's have a watch and listen to the first clip. It's quiet, but it's the only unsigned copy. 
It's quite the read. She claims the Tory party's disastrous kamikaze budget that triggered chaos for millions was, her words, the happiest moment of her premiership. Has the Prime Minister met anyone with a mortgage who agrees? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, all I'd say is he uh, ought to spend a bit less time reading that book and a bit and a bit more and a bit more time reading the deputy leader's tax advice. Quite a nice exchange. Sorry about the, quite, the tinny quality of that. I don't know if that's just Keir Thomas' voice, <laughs> voice or, could be. or just our recording. But there we go. Um, no, but it's interesting um, because you know, Rainer getting in that. No, it was so obvious, wasn't it? Liz Truss uh, launched her new book. Obviously, we had an interview with her on the show yesterday. Ten years to save the West. Um, Labour sort of rubbed their hands with glee whenever yeah. Liz Truss in the news because um, not a popular premiership. Only forty nine days is kind of the clue. Yes. Um, and then the view is that every time she's on the telly, it's good for Labour. Um, um, but I mean, a lot. Of, I mean, the point I suppose was really it was about the mini budget, which she really yes. didn't regret. No, indeed she didn't. And actually, it's interesting because it's been nearly a month actually since the last prime minister's question. It's been a long time because of the long Easter break. I, was and say, I thought you were going to say since the last prime minister, because <laughs> right, yes. there was a point when that was roughly the news. Oh, did, you didn't see the tweet from Jess Phillips by any chance? This was absolutely brilliant when Liz Truss said I was talking about the initial days of my premiership, and uh, J J Jess Phillips said also the closing days of your premiership because <laughs> they're all the same. Yeah. Yes. Um, but no, there, there was definitely a, an attempt there to bring in Liz Truss as much as possible. The more Keir Starmer can talk about Liz Truss, the better for him, the worse yep. for Rishi Sunak, even though Rishi Sunak is someone who clearly uh, wants to be disassociated with uh, Liz Truss's disastrous Yeah, I mean, there's no love lost between those no. people. I mean, I hosted one of the hostings. They, they weren't even speaking to each other. Well, she didn't even shake his hand when she won, do you remember? That, no. that whole thing. So there's, there's exactly. Although, although as she, when she came in for our interview, it, it'd been established in one of her previous, one of the other interviews, I, she was horrified by Sue Gray hugging. She says, I'm not a hugger. So I went over to her and said, I'm not going to hug you because you're not a <laughs> hugger. Am I allowed to shake your hand? Um, um, let's, uh, let's also have a watch and listen of uh, another one of those. Yeah, changes. it's interesting actually because the, the I mean, a lot of it was just barbs. There was a bit about Angela Rayner and you're coming for this working class woman. And so when you're a billionaire prime minister coming for a working class woman who's her, pulled herself up by her bootstraps, there's a bit of that kind of back and forth as well. I want to come back on that. Yeah, yes. but actually um, the, the substance, the real thing that we were talking about, I mean, there's so many things you could talk about. Iran, for example, but that's something on which Starmer and Sunak basically agree. So the point that uh, Keir Starmer tried to make a number of times was to get an answer out of Rishi Sunak in regard to the 46 billion promise to uh, cut national insurance in the next parliament. Where was that money going to come from? Keir Starmer kept asking. Rishi Sunak just didn't answer. OK, let's have a watch and listen to that clip. Is his £46 billion promise to abolish national insurance being paid for by cuts to the NHS, cuts to the state pension, or yet another Tory tax rise? Mr Speaker, he's really got to keep up, Mr Speaker. It's, it's, this, it's this government that's just delivered a £900 increase to the state pension. It's this government that's already committed to the triple lock for the next parliament. He had six opportunities. I didn't think I heard him say that, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to the NHS, you'd much rather be treated in Conservative-run NHS in England, not the Labour-run NHS in Wales. I mean, frankly, even though these are huge sums, Peter Cardwell, um, a lot of this is dancing on the head of a pin, isn't yeah. it, in terms of who's got the money for this and this green policy from the Labour Party and, and who's you know who's paying for this policy, you know, the VAT on schools from Labour to pay for one policy. This, I think an awful lot of voters are not paying attention to any of that. They're looking very much more at the big picture. Um, but I do want to come back to Angela Rayner. As you mentioned, again, interesting, you know, that the Keir Starmer accusing the Prime Minister, you know, you're, you're a millionaire married to a yes. billionaire's daughter um, and uh, you're smearing a working class mm. woman. I mean, look, a, um, a police are actually investigating the allegations yes. into Alistair Rainder and this the sale of her council house, whether or not she uh, gave wrong information on, on a birth certificate or electoral register. They can't mm. both be correct about where she was living, whether she has lied about where she was living because she claimed bizarrely she's got three kids, two of them with this guy, um, and she's married to him, and for some reason she's living in a different house. Because this is, of course, a completely normal family arrangement for most people. What a load of tosh. One mile away? I doubt it. Um, uh, but also, the neighbours say uh, this is where she lived, and it ain't the house she claimed she was mm. living in. Now, there is now a full police investigation. The Greater Manchester Police, uh, absurdly, the Chief Constable has uh, done an interview to, with the local media in Manchester and said you know, half a dozen officers are involved in this. I mean, 
seriously, this is one person's job at best. Call into council, electoral register, yeah. um, you know, go to the neighbours. And I, I, I mean, this is such basic stuff. I mean, any, you know, the journalists have got this information. But this isn't a smear from Rishi Sunak. This is this is a, a an accusation contained in a book mm. which has been taken very seriously by many. And there are questions to answer. And it's entirely irrelevant whether she's from a working class background or not. Or, or are we holding women from working class backgrounds who are from the north, because he's mentioned she's a northern working class woman before, to a lower standard than we are expect of billionaires? Well, that's a lot of people are asking that question. And the fact is that, you know, it's easy to smear, talking about smearing, it's easy to smear Rishi Sunak for who he fell in love with and married. It's easy to smear Michael Ashcroft, who wrote the book, for being a billionaire. But actually, when it comes to Angela Rayner, she has called at numerous occasions, including for Boris Johnson to stand down, when he was being investigated, not even, not even convicted. Not even convicted convicted of anything where she is being investigated she said of course that she will resign if she's found to have broken the rules or, or is uh, has a criminal um, some sort of criminal conviction as yeah, a but, result we, of this. but knowing surely that of course uh, some of the allegations against her like you know she claims she was living in house a when actually she was living in house b but if she on the electoral register if if, if she actually put the wrong address on that a that's not 100 percent proof anyway b it, you have to this 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 is something that can only be prosecuted within a year mm. so she'll she'll know that i mean does any of that matter? Well, is, and how it, damaging is it to Kirsten? Because look, he, there's no love lost between no, Kirsten and Angela Rayner. Yes. He, wouldn't he secretly rather like her to be damaged? Well, he hasn't read the legal advice, and that means that he doesn't. He's I mean, chosen this is, not he, to read he, he has chosen advice. not to. This is the former chief prosecutor of this country who hasn't decided to read a, a very presumably fairly straightforward piece of legal advice on a bit of tax thing, uh, a bit of tax affairs, which presumably he's done many, many times previously. He's chosen not to do that. He's given himself the clear blue water between him and Angela Rayner. This is going on now, I think, for seven weeks now. It's not mm. going to go away. Some the people who care about it do care about it. A lot of people, it'll wash yeah. over them. It'll not be a big thing. Benedict Spence, where are you on this? Because I mean, I, I'm, I've been sort of saying on, on the show for some weeks. You know, it's a complicated story. It's not so. It's not you know. Here's a you know. Here's a here's a brown envelope. Mm. Here's a wadge of cash. You know. You know. And, and hand it, it to someone. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's much. You know, it's a complicated story. Mm. It doesn't involve you know like Nadim Sahoy five million quid and threats to newspapers yeah. if they write about him not paying the due tax that he was due. I mm. mean, I was ba he was banged to rights on that, and he was absolutely right to go. I'm never mm. party political on this. I want our politicians to all be above the board. Lots of people will make the argument this is a woman who came from a very difficult background. Uh, you know, she was a carer for her parents, she became a single mom, she mm. left school without any qualifications, and she has pulled herself up by her bootstraps. I, despite her calling people like Toy Zoo scum and things, I actually rather like her. She'd mm. be horrified if you all knew we actually get on very well. Um, uh, this would be very bad for her, you know, her, 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 her reputation. Cred, yeah. But, you know, but, but there's actually a lot. To, there's a lot to to, to 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 give her credit for. Doesn't mean it's okay to mess about on 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 money that you may or may not have claimed from the council uh, yeah. unfairly. The problem is if you're going to sort of frame yourself as a Labour sort of left wing attack dog every time a Tory does something wrong, which she does, and she does very well. She draws headlines. She manages to you know bring yeah. attention to issues. If you're Probably going to do the best that, opposer on Labour's benches. I yeah, would yeah, say. yeah. Then do you, you think are. So? Yeah. I think she so. She gets under their skin to a big degree. She, gets she really does. But this is the thing. If you're going to make yourself that person, you have to be cleaner than clean. And you have to know, even if you are cleaner than clean, they're still going to come back for you because you are the lightning rod. Yeah. And the thing is, I think you're right to point out that Keir Starmer and she do not necessarily get on. And I do think that he will quietly be very happy that she is being taken down a peg or She's two. She's being damaged enough that she loses some of her power. It, it, yeah. it hobbles her slightly. Were there mm. ever... I don't think there is a question over a leadership but, challenge, but were there to be, I think it takes her down in the estimation. But there is a big difference, isn't there, between someone being a great tack dog in opposition and someone who, in a few months' time, yeah. could be the deputy prime minister of this country. Now, you know, John Prescott, very sort of similar credentials, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, and Tony Well, Blair's she called herself John Prescott in a skirt. Yes, yeah, exactly. That's an and, image um, I didn't and, uh, realise I needed. <laughs> 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 It'll never <laughs> leave you. Cool. <laughs> image, head out. Um, but, um, but, you know, and, and she did have that role. But I guess he had a lot more, who want to expression, bottom. He'd been around in politics for yeah. years. Her credentials, you know, and again, I still defend him for punching that guy through it. Again. Quite, <laughs> quite darn right. What did that guy expect? Um, you know, and I had a lot of time for him. And there were times, frankly, when Jordan Brown and Tony Blair were bickering the whole time, actually, that John Prescott was the grown-up in the room. Yes, yes. But, but you know, is there an element where this does just, you know, this just kind of lingers on 
Um, and even if there aren't any criminal charges, people will go, well, hold on a minute. You, you know, you're a hypocrite. You know, you, you've done something that, you know, mm. you know is wrong. Yeah, well, there is that as well. And also, it shouldn't matter whether she's working class or a billionaire or not. It's, you know, if it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's against yeah. the law, it's against the law. And that's what yeah. they're looking into. Absolutely. Just finally, I mean, you know, this is a pre-local elections PMQs. We're going to see a lot more of this, yeah. uh, obviously, ahead up to May the 2nd. Where are we on the polls there? How bad is it looking for the Tories? Just very, very bad for the Conservatives, as it has been nationally for the last two, three years. Um, certainly, I, I think there are, there are major questions for what happens for some of the mayoral uh, elections as well, especially in the West Midlands. That's going to be very Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, you've got mayor elections uh, in, in London as yep. well. Uh, Benedict Spence? Hope springs eternal for the Conservative Party. Who knows? Maybe they'll get a plane off to Rwanda, but you know, I don't think there's much to look not, forward not to. Not before May the 2nd, though, won't <laughs> no, you? But they don't not. think that. There's nothing um, on the horizon. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much indeed. Please stay put there. We're going to get back to some of your text messages and your calls uh, regarding Britain's strictest head teacher, Catherine Burble singing. I think we've all agreed we wanted to be Prime Minister. Set your own party up, Catherine. She's won a high court battle against a Muslim people who challenged the school's ban on prayer rituals for all pupils, by the way, of all faiths. I want to know your reaction. You can give us a call 0344 499 1000, text 87222, or get in touch at uh, x at talk tv. Um, some of your messages, uh, Harriet says, well done to the head teacher. You know what type of school it is when you register your child. It's then highly ridiculous for the child to bring a court case against them. Sarah says she's 100% right. Why should they get special treatment? School is for lessons, prayer at home. Well done to that head. Um, uh, Ian says, why can't the school at least just have a three or five minute prayer or moment of silence for each student to pray quietly to themselves with whatever their religion may be? Because because they don't need to. Other people clearly aren't demanding it. Uh, Stacey says, my personal opinion is we're a Christian country. Yep, legally, constitutionally, we are. The Lord's Prayer should be the only prayer recited in school, but during assembly, not disrupting lessons. And Tony says, well done. Pity the spineless politicians don't do the same. Let's go to uh, the phone calls now. Maisie is on the line in Hartford. Hello, Maisie. Hi. Hello. What do you want to say? Where? Whose side are you on? <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm not on anybody's side. Uh, I think the... Um the, the 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 school had the right to um to for their position the school is maintained as a secular school yeah um they could have gone another way but it's up to the school and the board of governors if they wanted to go another way uh, which would be inclusive um which would they could have if they wanted to and it's their decision um they could have had a, a prayer room or yeah, a meditation they, they said, or a, I, let me finish please or a meditation room they don't have a room students they don't yeah, have yeah. a room they made it really clear we have no spare rooms there is yeah. nowhere spare and so the point i'm making is that it's their decision and they decided that they don't have a room but it wasn't not but if they did have a if they wanted to go their own do do something different uh, inclusive they could have said there, just like they should have for send children, um, that there is a room for quiet meditation. Should anybody why? need but it? But why? Why? Why to. does a child need that? Why is that inclusive? What's inclusive is saying all children are the same. You're not a Muslim kid. You're not a Jewish kid. You're not a Sikh kid. You're just a kid yeah, and, at Michaela. And, and my point is, is that is for everybody, not for one particular mm. um, uh, religion or one particular faith. It's for. They could have, if they wanted to, done that. They could go and sit quietly in the playground and sit on a bench and have a quiet moment then, can't they? No, um, this is what I'm talking about is something different. You know, so I'm agreeing with what the court's decision yeah. and I'm saying that the school and the board of governors could have chosen and some indeed do choose to have a, a room yeah. aside for no for you, you said that but i'm telling you that one of the arguments we spoke to catherine burble sing on this was the school has incredibly small premises and there is no spare space and giving up a space to something like that that doesn't involve anything to do with children learning and doing well in life and going on to have a great future i think it's a waste of school space i'm with i'm with michaela school all along Maisie, thank you so much for your call really appreciate that 12 48 is the time up next going to talk about the most important story of the day where do you get your strawberry jam from well, of course you get it from the wonderful Duchess of Sussex. Do you not? That's up next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl. 
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth blimp. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 what did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Julia Hartley-Brew on Talk TV. I can't believe it's taken us until 12.51 to get to the most important story of the day and a guest on the most important story of the day, which, of course, is the launch of the first product of Duchess of Sussex, Sussex Meghan Markle's uh, uh, new lifestyle brand. I mean, let's face it, it's what we're all talking about. Uh, let's go to our royal commentator guest, Kinsey Schofield. Good afternoon to you, Kinsey. Julia, I can't believe that I spent three or four years having to answer questions about Meghan Markle running for president to be telling you today <laughs> that the big announcement is that she's released some strawberry jam to 50 of her friends on Instagram. I mean, exactly. I mean, how the mighty are fallen. Um, the thing I can't get over is this, we've told this big lifestyle brand, big rebranding, you know, the whole new set of staff, um, new, new website. I mean, a horrible typeface, by the way, but the name of it is called American Riviera Orchard. It's like they just chose three random words. I've decided if I launch my own lifestyle brand, and it's only a matter of time, uh, it's going to be British Seaside Allotment. I think that's the equivalent, <laughs> isn't it? British Seaside Allotment. But I'd like to have something more interesting than strawberry jam. I mean, it's supposed to be this sort of, you know, highfalutin, the Duchess of Sussex's lifestyle brand. Strawberry jam. Is that the best she can come up with? I mean, and, and it's like you know i just said we have been waiting for whatever it is that their answer baited to breath what, baited what, breath yes what life outside of royalty is and the idea that it's this strawberry jam the way that she did the slow unroll by just look the the label is peeling off how dodgy is that ah, the way ah. she does this slow release by just sending it to the one percent in santa barbara if you go to her website and like you were talking about that font clearly just a, a rip off of a donald trump golf course font <laughs> um if you go ah. to that website all you can do is put your email address in you can't even you can't buy, buy this product do we know yes. how much it will cost is this going to be a sort of a 32 dollar straw Strawberry jam. 
I imagine that that's the ultimate objective, but I, you know, I challenge anyone to, I challenge anyone to, 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 to actually find somebody that will purchase that. Oh no, there will be people who will purchase it. Um, what I think um, my colleague Benedict Spencer, who's been sitting here, was suggesting these should have been called Duchess, Duchess Originals, rather you know, in the wake of the, the, the you know, King now King Charles's Duchy Originals, um, or you know, I don't know Duchess Derivatives. I mean, it's quite bizarre. What other items are they going to be? Because we're told isn't there some sort of fifty things that she's going to sell as our lifestyle brand. Yes, so these are just in her legal documents to secure the rights to these things. It's um, yoga mats, it's dog shampoo and conditioner, it's different oils you can cook with. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on, and there's not a real theme. It's just kind of everything under the sun. And I, you know, obviously her ultimate objective is to build an empire. The the type that you see Gwyneth Paltrow enjoying, the type that you see Martha Stewart enjoying. I do not want her to sell sca candles that smell the same as Gwyneth Paltrow's candles, which apparently are um, another region's. I mean, oh, just, <laughs> but no, that, that's where this is going. Now, is this basically, they need to make money somehow. They have a very expensive lifestyle, very big, uh, uh, you know, mansion in, in Montecito. They've got, you know, numerous guards and, and, and security they have to pay for. And they like a certain lifestyle. I mean, we all see her out and about with dresses and she's got, you know, a handbag that costs $10,000. Um, I mean, whether she's getting it for free or not, I don't know. But, but is it just, you know, the Netflix gig, the Spotify gig a lot of this stuff is kind of disappearing and this is how she hopes to make their dosh well i think that with netflix they're they need to change public perception so they're she's going to give them almost that essentially reality show access where she's in the kitchen unscripted i mean it'll be highly oh, scripted gosh. Yeah, but, but you know i think that she's going to try to utilize netflix not only to change public perception of her but to push these products and it's going to be a glorified QVC a la Fergie in 19 whatever, 1990 Ouch. whatever, blenders at 3 a.m. Um, but, you know, I do think that they are limited in what they're capable of doing today yeah. when their likability yeah. is down the gutter. Absolutely. Do you want the, I mean, actually, I quite, I quite like some of her clothes, but do you want the lifestyle of Megan? I don't know. Um, Kinsey's going for great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. I, Benedict, uh, uh, I just want to spend, uh, do, do you think I've, I've got some success with Britain? British Seaside Allotment brand? I don't Julia Hartley Brewer, lifestyle brand, British Seaside Allotment. I don't think as much success as I'm going to have with Dulwich Coastal Erosion, which could also be <laughs> Norfolk Longshore Drift, <laughs> Or indeed, North Sea Oil platform. I'm open to any of these. You know, I've got I've got an empire already on the on the way. It's only a matter of time, <laughs> is it? Benedict Spence, such a pleasure having you company. Thank, Thank you. you very much. You know, I'm done for another day. Back with you at uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Up next, it is a. Okay. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of Cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. 